participants, we are now live. Good morning. This is the Special Committee on Gun Violence, Friday, March 11th of 2022. I understand that state law currently requires that the following announcement be made at the beginning of every remote public hearing as follows. Due to the current public health emergency, city council committees are currently meeting remotely. We are using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at public hearings of council committees are included in the public hearing notices that are published in the Daily News, Enquirer, and Legal Intelligencer prior to the hearings and can also be found on phlcouncil.com. Will the clerk please call the roll to take attendance? Members that are in attendance will please indicate they are present when their names are called. Also, please say a few brief words when responding so that your image will be displayed on screen when you speak. I'm going to ask everybody to please put their microphone on mute. I'm going to ask for the clerk to please call the roll. Council Member Mark Squilla. Next week. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and colleagues present. Council Member Isaiah Thomas. Councilwoman Kendra Brooks. Good morning, I'm present. Good morning, present. Councilmember Helen Gim. Good morning, everybody. I am present. And Councilmember Curtis Jones. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, colleagues, viewing public, I'm present. Thank you. This hearing is now called to order. This is the public hearing of the Special Committee on Gun Violence regarding Resolution 211007. Will the clerk please read the title of the resolution? Resolution 211007, uh, authorizing the Special Committee on Gun Violence Prevention to conduct, conduct hearings to examine the correlation between domestic violence and gun violence. Before we begin to hear testimony from the witnesses we have for today, everyone who has been invited to the meeting to testify should be aware that the public hearing is being recorded. Because this hearing is public, participation and viewers have no reasonable expectation of privacy. By continuing to be in the meeting, you are continuing to being recorded. Additionally, prior to recognizing members for the questions or comments they have for witnesses, I will note for the record at this time that we will use the chat feature available on Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized in order to comply with the Sunshine Act. The chat feature must only be used for this purpose. I want to thank all my colleagues and distinguished guests and panelists and the public for participating in this hearing. I have convened this hearing to examine the close relationship between domestic violence, and gun violence. Over 5 million women in this country have been shot, shot at, or threatened with a gun by an intimate partner. Here in the city of Philadelphia, killings of women have risen rapidly, partly due to increased domestic violence. And domestic violence doesn't just affect its victims and their families. A, a 2019 Every time and every town analysis found that more than half of mass shooters over the prior decade has shot an intimate partner or a family member. The pandemic has intensified this domestic gun violence crisis. Many people have been forced to spend more time at home. Job insecurity and housing insecurity have increased. Stress levels are off the charts. And on top of it all, gun sales have hit record levels. My goal in this hearing is to highlight the problem, explore recent trends, and begin to identify solutions. We owe it to our constituents, especially the most vulnerable, to get our arms around this issue. I look forward to an enlightening discussion today. With that being said, I want to recognize any of my colleagues who have any additional remarks and thank them for joining this hearing today. Hearing none, will the clerk please call the first panel for resolution 211007. 
For the first panel, we have Fran Healy and Inspector Frank Venor. Good morning, Council. Good morning, Fran and Frank. It's good to see both of you. Um, start off by saying just thank you for your service to the city of Philadelphia. And you can begin your testimony by stating your title and beginning. I'm Chief Inspector Frank Van Orr. I am in charge of the Detective Bureau for the Philadelphia Police Department. And, uh, my name is Francis Healy. I'm a special advisor to the Police Commissioner. Um, the, the, the operation today, will the Chief Van Orr will go through the PowerPoint presentation with the slides uh, identifying the trends of domestic violence over the last several years. And after that point, uh, the Chief, myself, as well as uh, Chief Inspector, I uh, love Craighead or is on the call to answer any other questions that people may have as to what we're doing, coordinating all our efforts with other city agencies as well. So I'll let the chief begin. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to go through some trends and patterns and statistics that our department was able to put together in reference to just what council is meeting about today. Uh, the apparent absolute uh, increase in domestic related gun violence. Um, so if you want to Move to the next slide. I'll begin and show you some of what we put together. Um, so domestic assaults increased despite non-domestic assaults remaining really the same. Uh, from 2017 all the way up to the end of last year, uh, the number of domestic assaults increased by about 18%. Now, if you look relatively uh, from 17 through 21, uh, domestic assaults increased from being about 35% of all assaults to being about 39% of all assaults. Um, granted, the assaults did rise during that period of time, um, so uh, it was a, a, significant, a significant increase. But you're gonna see an even more significant in increase on the next slide. Um, so in the very next slide, we're gonna talk about the trends of domestic gun assaults. And this is where it's really uh, frightening numbers when you're looking at um, both domestic and non-domestic assaults with guns increased in between 2017 and 2021. Um, and specifically, um, domestic assaults with guns increased 106% in that five year period. Now we all know we went through we went through the pandemic, people were inside, but this is certainly a significant increase, especially when you're looking at going from around 345 to over 700. Uh, among those assaults, the gun assaults shared uh, of the domestic assaults, um, they increased from 16% in 2017 to 19% uh, in, in 2021. Looking at the uh, next slide, the homicide numbers, um, domestic related homicides showed a similar increase in trends with non-domestic homicides um, with the exception of 2020, which I couldn't explain to you other than everybody was in uh, a state of chaos in that particular year, so I'm not sure, but we definitely uh, decreased a little bit in that period. Uh, the proportion of domestic homicides among the overall homicides remained somewhat steady at about 7%. And you all know we had 562 homicides last year, so 42 of them were domestic related compared to the number of um, homicides we had in previous years, which was uh, around 7% of those homicides. Looking at the uh, next slide, um, we look at homicides, domestic homicides with a gun, uh, and, and those domestic homicides with guns showed a similar increase in trends to non-domestic homicides with the exception of 2020. The proportion of domestic homicides with guns among all the homicides with guns have remained somewhat steady around three to five percent um, but we uh, we certainly had a little bit of an increase because of the numbers going up throughout the city um, some of the stuff that's really disproportionate and the next few slides you're going to look at is when we look at domestic homicides by neighborhood uh, and the next slide will show a map and a chart of of what you're seeing there um, we ranked the top 10 uh, neighborhoods that had domestic related homicides between 2017 and this year really up until the 9th of March. Uh, and you'll see that, you know, the Frankfurt neighborhood, Kensington, Olney, they list as the top three. All of them are listed there on your chart, if you could see it. Uh, there are some neighborhoods on this map that are white that have absolutely no domestic related homicides recorded. So that's some specific targeted data that we could use 
um, when we start to build our plan to be more proactive in these uh, trying to prevent uh, these homicides. But that's a very telling um, map where you see everything's really concentrated in those areas. And the next, um, the next uh, map would show assaults by neighborhood, uh, domestic related assaults. That could be a simple assault as much as a strike in uh, another individual, or it could be something, uh, as we talked about with a gun, shooting at or, or harming somebody in a, in a manner which we would call aggravated assault. Some of those same neighborhoods line up, uh, and you'll see all those assault calls and, and investigations uh, listed there from Kensington to Cops Creek, Germantown, North Central Police Division, which is uh, right in the uh, area of Strawberry Mansion, King, King Sessing, Southwest, Haddington, Frankfurt. Uh, the Strawberry Mansion neighborhood is listed twice, so that's divided between the North Central area and Strawberry Mansion. But that has a significant number if you add them together and you have the Tioga area. So to summarize these data points, um, uh, domestic assaults, despite the non-domestic uh, assault remaining steady, um, between 17 and 21, the number of domestic assaults increased by 18%. Um, so it's very significant. Notably, uh, the increase in assaults with guns occurred from 2020 and later, which is when we were dead smack in the middle of the pandemic with quarantines and, and people people all staying home, including children and, and adults. A relatively small portion of homicides uh, are domestic in nature, uh, but they account for 7% of all our homicides. And noted that the, the low count of domestic homicides makes it difficult to compare year to year, um, but that's something that we're trying to do. And domestic assaults and homicides are disproportionately uh, concentrated in some neighborhoods. And that's what we showed in those maps um, that we showed today. So something I'd be remiss from not uh, uh, adding into this presentation, which is not here, is in February of 2021, uh, we started counting crime differently. Um, we used we went from the Uniform Crime Reporting System to the National Incident Based Reporting System, which the whole country uses. The incident-based reporting system is very specific about relationships. Uh, as we do our investigative reports, as we capture our data, um, we are capturing uh, everybody's relationship to each other. So when we say something is domestic related now, it could be a brother, sister, a cousin, aunt. If they're, if they're living together, uh, if an assault occurs, that's gonna be now categorized as domestic related. So that's very important. Not all of these are um, um, spouse or significant other, uh, male, female, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it would be. Uh, some of these are family, uh, brothers, um, cousins, uh, sister-in-law. One of my homicides involves a, a sister-in-law disputing um, with a, a, another a female. So it's very important to understand that, that, that the categorization changed. We're really closely monitoring relationships between people and in all those cases, everybody was known to each other uh, before the incident began. So I'll open it for questions or if uh, Inspector Healy would have any further comment. Sure. Uh, just to piggyback on what the chief just mentioned, uh, the definitions that are consistent with the, the crimes code in Pennsylvania, as well as the domestic code, the definition of that relationship is much broader than just a husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend type situation. So our numbers capture the domestic related incidents so all these don't necessarily mean they're against a, a woman. It could be family members that had a, a, an assault or disagreement. Also, I just want to touch on very quickly, um, trying to be proactive with the PFA issues as well as the gun relinquishments under Act 79. Um, the Sheriff's Department, uh, the Police Department, and the courts have, have worked rather well together. We've, we've got a very good, solid agreement to make sure that you know balls don't get dropped between the agencies because in Philadelphia, it is a unique situation being a, a such a large city, a, a city of the first class, where the sheriff and the police have kind of very similar duties when it comes to the P, uh, Act 79. So we've, we've worked very well together at identifying the responsibilities between our agencies so we're not duplicating efforts. Uh, and also what we've done is we've made sure that there are available places for people to relinquish firearms um, so as uh, they feel comfortable in doing so. We, we don't want to make it difficult for somebody who's legitimately trying to relinquish a firearm and everything above board and make it difficult for them. 
So we've actually opened up the detective division. We have six detective divisions throughout the city, in addition to the sheriff's office who can accept these firearms during the day. But on off hours and holidays and weekends, um, Commissioner Outlaw has authorized the detective division to accept any firearm relinquishments as well. Um, so we're doing, we're working as a concerted effort um, with the court, uh, making sure that we all communicate with each other, which is key in this process. So we all have dedicated email addresses now between the sheriff's PPD as well as the court. Um, for uh, making sure that all the notifications are made when necessary and that everybody's getting up to speed information. And also for the court's perspective that this information will be able to be docketed uh, as it's supposed to be in Act 79. We've done a lot of work behind the scenes to make sure that we do everything possible to protect these victims. Um, so I'm happy to talk, answer any questions or how, how the investigations are conducted as well as if um, uh, Chief uh, Love Craighead's on the call She's also doing a lot of proactive work on the, I mean, it may not be in the front end, but she's doing it with the um, Community Relations Bureau, reaching out to potential victims as possible and previous victims and see what other services they can do to help the department. Thank you. Um, that, and that's the point where I was ready to go at. Could you give us an idea of, well, one, is there any specialized training around for officers when it comes to dealing with issues of domestic violence. And then two, I know with the new categorization of domestic violence um, issues is, is general, but is there an ability to separate, right, the spousal aspect of um, domestic violence, particularly around gun violence, or even men when they are assaulting, particularly their spouse? So... We, as far as the training goes, and in fact, this year already we've we've received some training uh, through our partners, Women Against Abuse. Uh, individual came in who was a retired Nashville um, police officer. He had a lot of training uh, and a lot of success in Nashville of being uh, preventing incidents like this. And what his program is is really doing what we do with the GVI program. We look for who the uh, the greatest harm is in in these in, in these places and we try to identify them and quickly um quickly assess that this could be a problem in the future uh and we did that we trained police officers detectives and supervisors uh, along with command staff to do that and also let me just jump in the, the women against abuse have been a great partner with us for not just this year but as long as I can remember in my position up here in the police commissioner's office they've always uh, sought out grant money uh, to help us with training uh, our domestic violence officers. So we have a very good relationship and we're very appreciative of the work that they do for our department. Is the training um, volunteer or was it mandatory? No, it was, it was training that we gave uh, across the city and it was actually paid for by the uh, Women Against Abuse Project and officers did it uh, not on their regular tour of duty, but we actually brought them in to do it. So it was definitely voluntary, but many people uh, went through it. it. It was good training, and we're going to continue to to work with them. Awesome. Um, and the uh, and the and the second part of that question regarding the categorization of domestic violence incidents, uh, is there a way to se to separate, particularly um, incidents involving intimate partners? So everybody's frozen on my screen. So if you lose me, I'll come right back on. But. I apologize, but uh, what in, in mid 2000s, uh, then Deputy Commissioner Pat Giorgio Fox introduced a new reporting procedure for officers. We have a, a, a initial report we only use for domestic violence. And on that report, uh, we're able to mark down what relationships are uh, and a lot of other significant uh, information we need. Each of my detective divisions have uh, domestic violence investigators. So we use them reports to try to track repeat call analysis, to try to see if there's issues such as uh, a protection from abuse order, if there is a gun in play in any of these ownership, we try to intervene in those cases right away. And that's where uh, Chief Inspector Love Craighead's people could come in and help us because they uh, will liaison with one of the parties, both of the parties to see if, if somebody would be willing to talk to us, uh, be a witness, so we can move forward and, and make sure we don't have violence as we move forward. And if I can just jump in, oh, sorry, uh, that form that the chief best mentioned, that was uh, coordinated with the University of Penn uh, and some of their uh, social science experts. 
uh, identifying that strangulation is, is a very big indicator and we're trying to prioritize and a lot of that information is now included on that form so the investigators have much more information uh, to actually do proactive work. But to answer your specific question, whether I can just pull out specific information, um, I'd honestly have to get back to you on that because um, the, the new system, I don't know if they can break it out uh, specifically by a type of relationship other than just domestic, but I, I will get back to you on that. Okay, thank you. And, and, and another question, how does 911 triage um, domestic violence cause, right? Because obviously uh, there's a lot of gun violence, there's a lot of crime taking place in the city of Philadelphia, so that's going to determine the type of response time, right? But oftentimes, at least it's been my experience, person may call because boyfriend may be aggravating them, may be trying to assault them, may be threatening them, right? Um, in some cases, response time may be a little longer, right, when a person is trying to seek help, right? And then obviously, depending on how agitated the individual is, the perpetrator is, it may go from threatening to physical to let me get a gun. Is there a way to uh, particularly bring domestic violence issues with, gun violence, with guns up on a higher scale when a person does call um well i'll mention a, a gun call in and of itself will be highly will be a high priority mm -hmm. but the issue what um just there's an overlap between some of the all the things we're trying to do i don't know if you're familiar well, I'm, I'm, i know you are familiar with the co-responder model that we're implementing in police department yeah. along with the upgrade in the police radio all this kind of wraps into the, what you're just mentioning so when these calls are now coming in um we don't really mention it, it's really not necessarily a mental health issue it's a crisis call a lot of these are crisis situations where people are out of control, uh, even if it's temporarily. So the issue is we're asking mental health questions up front to try to capture more information so we can push it down to police officers. But also, as a part of this process, we are identifying certain calls that we are sending automatically now CIT trained, that's crisis intervention trained officers to, okay. and domestic related calls are one of those calls. So those calls are coming in once we can identify that it's a domestic related um, obviously, if they're calling, they're, everybody is usually in some form of crisis, and crisis is not a bad word. Crisis, we can all go through crisis at any point in time. At that point there, they're being tagged as CIT calls, so our radio is then pushing out to the first or the, the closest available CIT officers to get to the call. So that's that's been a huge win with the um, the script that we're, we're operating, and we've been tagging many more of these calls. But the domestic calls would be tagged as CIT related, so those officers with the additional de-escalation skills would be brought in, um, and then handled from there. Good, good. And this is my last question before I turn it over to my colleagues. Um, I know Councilman Curtis Jones either had a hearing or introduced a recommended bill on the state level that deals with. And you touched on this early on, but I just want you to um, take more of a deeper dive in it. So person have protection protection from abuse order, but that person has a license to carry, right? Um, and Kurt, I may need your help to elaborate on this because this is your issue. How do we address that? Like this person you got the you know protection from abuse order, um, erratic behavior wise, right? What happens when the wife or spouse would come? You know, whoever the spouse is, they call it in. They got the protection of abuse, but they said, I want you to know that he does own a gun. What happens? What starts that process? Just can I, can I help you, right. Mr. Um, yes. Mr. Chair? So a lot of yes. the red flag laws also apply that if someone um, in, in a domestic abuse piece and it is found guilty, they're supposed to remove all firearms from that person until uh, it is resolved. In addition, if people uh, exhibit threatening behavior, red flag laws uh, allow uh, the um, police department, the authority to come in and confiscate weapons until there is a hearing before a judge so that that person proves himself not a threat. So if, if they can elaborate and include the red flag provisions as well. I think that would be helpful, helpful, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'll try to get everything in. There's two issues with the domestic violence as to relinquishments. One is uh, relinquishments issued as part of a PFA when somebody has not been convicted of a crime. 
Um, if somebody now, if somebody uh, actively uses a firearm in the commission of some offense, and we come on scene, we seize the firearm as we would in any other crime. But the person may not have used a firearm, but then a subsequent order is issued where the gun has to be relinquished. Uh, in that case, there, that's part of the agreement with the sheriff's office I mentioned earlier. There's a, uh, a sheriff's order. Uh, I'm sorry. Step one would be the sheriffs normally serve most of these orders. A handful of complaints will actually go to the police district and we'll serve them. But if there's any guns in there, we'll say, listen, we, we know you have guns. You need to relinquish the guns. Uh, and they do so. We, we document them according to the, uh, the law and we, we preserve them over at the show. Now crime, OK, which was didn't it wasn't there before. And under Act 79 requires people with the, um, the with the PFA relinquishments to uh, turn the guns over within 24 hours. That's that's a huge thing. So making sure that's really the reason why the sheriffs and I had to really work out the details to make sure that once we get notice from the court, the clock starts ticking. Somebody doesn't show up with the guns, and then we actually will initiate a criminal investigation to see whether or not they even have any guns, if they haven't relinquished them, whatever the case may be. And I'll get into the, the complexity of whether that they do or do not have guns in a second. But the second side of the whole issue of Act 79 is the domestic related convictions. So once somebody's, um, I'm, take a step back. If you get a PFA and you have a firearms relinquishment on it, that's not permanent. Okay, after it's, the, it's expired, you can petition, get your firearms back, and every, if everything's fine, everything goes back to normal. However, if you've been convicted of a domestic-related misdemeanor, you were forever prohibited under, under federal law from possessing firearms and ammunition. So what happens is wow. the court is required, and the court has mechanisms in place now. I've talked to a Judge Clemens where they actually issue a relinquishment order to the individuals who have now been convicted. So imagine you were, you were convicted of a domestic-related assault. You have three firearms. You now have to get rid of those firearms. You cannot possess them. Uh, the previous law prior to Act 79 gave you, I believe, 60 days to turn those firearms in or to dispossess them, meaning you have to sell them. You have to get them out of your name. Um, uh, so Act 79 has also changed that to 24 hours. So the people who are, receive a domestic-related conviction that have 24 hours to turn it turn it in. So Judge Clemens is creating documentation to make sure that the individuals are given that notice, and then I get notice that they've received their notice. And then if they if we know that they have any firearms and they haven't turned them in, then we will create um, a, a criminal investigation. Uh, Commissioner Outlaw has actually uh, dedicated or identified the gun permits unit, which falls under the uh, Detective Bureau. Uh, to be the central conduit so as we have one person or a handful of people that are doing this every day so we don't drop any balls in the middle uh, so the gun permits unit will get this information and then co coordinate with each of the detective divisions as to where the the offender may live and they'll do they'll conduct the investigation for the new offense which is failure to relinquish the firearm within 24 hours which is a misdemeanor offense now so that's the process now let me take a step back as to knowing whether or not somebody has a firearm or doesn't have a firearm in Pennsylvania, it's not that easy. Um, there is a central, there is no centralized database per se. We have access to one from the state, but if it, it covers mostly initial purchases and sales. So you buy a gun at a gun shop, now all that stuff's recorded. However, secondary sales, shotguns, rifles, and that kind of stuff are very difficult to track. And also, like I said, some folks have illegal guns and that's completely impossible for us to track. Um, I just, I'm just throwing this out there. I don't know if anybody wants to advocate maybe at a state level, but I know, I do know, like I said, we can't go into someone's house once they have a PFA. We said, oh, we think you have a gun or she said you had a gun, but we can't find a gun in a, in a, in a database. We just can't go in. We'd, ha we'd still need a search warrant. Um, other states, and I do know for a fact, New Jersey, when they issue their PFA, it also has attached to it a search warrant for local law enforcement to actually Regardless of what you may say, I can go in the house and still look for guns. So what we did is to make sure that there's a loophole. Not, I wouldn't call it a loophole, but it's just we're in Pennsylvania. I mean, Pennsylvania is a very pro-gun state, so it's very hard to get any concrete uh, information on the guns. So what we did is in the agreement between myself and the sheriffs, the sheriffs are the ones that usually go out to the, knock on the door and ask people, do you have, you know, you got an order? Do you have any guns? And they say, oh, no, I don't have any guns. Well, they can't go in the house, nor can I. But... If the sheriffs, their law enforcement professionals, like police department, or police officers, if they feel that something's not right, and they often can, we've created an additional mechanism that they can notify my gun permits unit. Say, listen, something's not right. 
I need an investigation started. So we're not just taking the fact that we can't find anything in an, in an electronic database. We're kind of making sure that, you know, the frontline officers are out on the knocking on doors. If they have any suspicions like that and we can build probable cause. We'll push it up to the you know DA's office for a search warrant and we'll, we'll go forward. So we're, we're really coordinated and make sure that we don't, uh, miss anything. I mean, we're trying to get as many of the guns that need to be relinquished, but in Pennsylvania, it's a very difficult, if somebody doesn't tell me you have a gun, um, it can be very hard for me to find out if you actually do or don't have a firearm. I hope I answered your questions. You did, um, Francis, and I want to commend um, you, Frank, and Commissioner Outlaw for the partnership with the courts and the sheriff's department. The sheriff, she'll be on, Rochelle Bilal, Commissioner, Sheriff Rochelle Bilal will be on later on um, also to update um, their role, but I just want to commend you and your team uh, for this type of partnership. That's being proactive. That's being preventative. And at the end of the day, the collaboration is key um, in addressing this type of issue. So it does stick out in terms of your presentation. That's all I have. Any other can questions I, or comments? Can I just add one thing? I, sorry, I just want to sure. add one thing. Um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say this, but the Managing Director's Office has been key to really making sure this collaboration between the different agencies has happened. So without their assistance, like I said, it, it would have been a little more difficult. So I do appreciate all the help from the MBO's office. Absolutely. I will make sure to acknowledge all um, the good work of my good friend, Tumar Alexander, as well as the interim managing director, um, Vanessa. Um, any other questions or comments from members of the committee? <clears throat> um, Council Spelling Gim. Yes, and thank I want to you also so much. acknowledge the presence of I want to acknowledge the presence of Councilman Isaiah Thomas, and now I want to acknowledge Councilman Helen Gim. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Um, so uh, thank you so much, um, Francis, for the information. Um, you know, I think my first set of questions is about Act Seventy Nine. So. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested in hearing what the actual numbers are on the collection. So I understand that there's a process and there's efforts to improve coordination, but could you give us the actual numbers for 2021 and, um, you know, in terms of 2020 and 2021, 2020 and 2021 in terms of the numbers of guns that are actually collected? I'm sorry, ma'am, I don't have those direct numbers. Uh, like I said, the, the sheriff ha most likely has some numbers. I don't know if they're prepared to give numbers today. I don't think that was the basis of uh, our understanding. But we'll, if we don't have them today, for I'll, I'll work with the sheriff's office to get whatever we have. Okay. And then, um, so PPD and the sheriff's department individually go out for the, um, f when there's a required relinquishment of a firearm? Well, it's not necessarily relinquishing. We go out with the, with the issuance of a PFA order. What happens right. is the PFA orders are issued by the court, uh, and I believe every day the sheriff's office goes, picks up these orders, and then they have a process of then going out and serving them. And some of these orders, the final orders all now, because of Act 79, have a relinquishment order. Now, other orders, not every order, PFA order comes, emergencies and temporaries, not every one of them has a, a, a relinquishment order unless there's an issue and the judge orders one. Um, mm -hmm. So, in the process of serving that order, if there is a relinquishment order, they'll say, listen, you have to relinquish any firearms. Do you have any firearms? Um, in that case there, the individual at the door can say, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have any firearms. And I believe yes, the I sheriff's under mm -hmm. I understand the process. What is the PPD's role in that process versus the sheriff's department's role? Uh, it's kind of a joint role in a way. Okay, uh, they, so that's what I wanted to ask. So, I think my question is... From the PPD side, could you share with us in 2020 and 2021, the number of orders that came to PPD that required a relinquishment, and then the number of guns that were collected as a result? I don't have those numbers with me, ma'am. Oh, no, I know I know you may not have them with you right now. Could you send them over to the chair? Uh, I'll do the best I can, yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the... Um, I think my next set of questions uh, is about, I mean, I guess, you know, there has been some some concern about, you know, what is needed to improve the collection of these firearms. I mean, obviously, everybody wants guns off the street. 
And if we actually have a court order to remove guns off the street, um, we want to be able to execute on those orders um, because that's actually something where we can do that and it's mandated and, you know, we have a lot of leeway to do that. Um, and of course, because it involves vulnerable families. Could you speak to how PPD's practices are, sp I know you went through the process, but could you speak to any changes or improvements that are made to improve the number of weapons that are actually um, relinquished or confiscated? On behalf, like I said, the I think what's important is the process that's been put in place by coordinating the gun permits unit as a central repository between the agencies. Because if a gun, if we believe a gun has not been relinquished, we are now actively creating a, a criminal investigation. We're not just letting it sit there. Well, Frank Healy didn't turn on the gun. What do we do? If we believe he had a firearm, which is something that we've never had before, we now, gun permit unit, will then send it to the appropriate detective division where I live and to open up a job basically for the for the new uh, uh, the new law, uh, I'm sorry, the new violation, the new misdemeanor. And what happens is in the course of that, um, there will be search warrants uh, either, you know, applied for with the district attorney's office, which will allow us to go in the house and hopefully recover the guns that people have failed to relinquish. So I do hope uh, in the in the future that we will be able to hopefully people will start relinqu or sending in the guns voluntarily than having us go get them and then lock them up in the process. So could hopefully in the future. How, could you tell I'm me sorry. how many investigations you opened in 2021? Not off the top of my head, ma'am. I'll have to I'll check with the detective bureau. Okay. Yeah, uh, I would have to look into those investigations and uh, I'll get it to Inspector Healy to get over to you. But I'm, I'm okay. not sure. We do get notified. They'll go to the domestic violence teams. Um, they handle, you know, thousands of domestic violence investigations mm -hmm. per year, and that could be anything from an assault or a threat or harassment uh, all the way up. So I'll take a look at those and see if we could discern which ones were connected to these and make sure we let you know. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. And as I said, um, you know, I don't expect it right now, but if we could just have it sent over to the chair, that would help a lot because, you know, we obviously want you to be successful on this um, and are interested if there are any problems or gaps, um, how we can <clears throat> improve on all of that. So um, my next set of questions is a little bit about, um, you know, how, how the police department is responding to the inter intimate partner violence calls. Do you have a current average response time? Um, I, I know that the information is tracked by police rate. I don't know if it's, if it's tracked by um, the offense type per se. I'd have to check with Deputy Commissioner Coulter. I really don't know. I know we do track um, the time the call comes in, the time it's dispatched and the, and the response time. But I, honestly, I, I don't know if it's tracked that way, but that's a good, very, very good question. I will ask. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, on the domestic violence homicide data that you shared, could you share what percent of the incidences, and this is you know, mostly going in about what do we know about some of the, um, the homicides. You know, we're trying to break down, um, in particular, obviously, the, the homicide data. Um, do you know what percent of the incidences, percent or number, um, probably both actually, involved a situation where a protection order was already in place? Um, I'm sure we have that within the homicide files. That's something I would have to have researched to give you if there was a protection order. Uh, we always kind of look back at these incidents to see what we knew. In some cases, we knew nothing. There were no prior calls, mm -hmm. um, not even a, a, a disturbance that we had. And in other cases, there was a previous arrest where uh, the person was arrested for assaulting the same individual. So uh, to look and see if there were protection orders, I would certainly be able to do that and uh, get back to you for the uh, the incidents that occurred in 2021. Is that what you uh, would, would like I, to say? I, no, I would, I would probably look at 2017 to 2021. I mean, you want to okay. do it over a range of time. And in part, it's because, um, you know, in it's not completely related, but somewhat. I mean, you know, our colleague, Council Member Jones, um, 
does a hundred shooter review. You know, that was very informative. It helps us identify gaps. In the city of Philadelphia, we pass a law that has us look at, you know, for example, settlements and payouts. And we're looking for openings and patterns. Similarly, I guess whether the, the main reason why I ask that is whether we as a city engage in any reviews or evaluations where there's a death lent a homicide linked to intimate partner violence to identify issues or areas where we might be able to make changes. Very good. I'll, I'll do my best to get that as quickly as we can. Thank you. That's very helpful. You know, we've personally, you know, been dealing with a terrible situation involving an a young woman um, whose family was, you know, her children were assaulted and everything. But, you know, it sounded like, um, there were problems before. And so we're just trying to understand um, a little better. What data do we have? Do we track? And um, how can we improve? Um, I think my other question is a little bit, my colleagues and I invested very heavily in um, DBH, IDS's mobile crisis units. We're heavily invested in 911 dispatch doing, um, you know, being newly trained around um, you know the mental health response calls that we're doing. Uh, this is important work. I know it's critical work for all of you at the department. Um, you know, and Inspector Healy, I think you talked a little bit about uh, that there are CIT trained officers. So I guess one question would be, what percentage of the police force, given you know how much the domestic violence numbers have uh, gone up, how much, how much, how, what percentage of the uh, police force is formally CIT trained? Um, right now we have over 2,900. Uh, we've trained well over 3,000, but with um, people transitioning out, uh, retiring. And I, I'll get to the exact percentage, but that's close to, oh, oh, close to 45 to 50%. Um, most CIT programs across the country kind of tap out at 20, 25%. That's the model. Here in Philadelphia, like I said, we, we think of CIT as much broader than mental health. It's people in crisis, uh, which is, like I said, what's most important is how the officer and the individual, when they react at that moment in time. So whether it's mental health or crisis for another reason really honestly doesn't matter. It's how the officer responds to the crisis. So we, we've never stopped at the 25, 25% mark. So uh, we have a class usually, uh, every, we try to run it every month except for the summer uh, because the summers with vacations. Uh, COVID put us, didn't put us back, but we had to slow down the classes because the classes are usually about 30 to 35 individuals. Uh, we had we had to break them down like 15 with the COVID restrictions. But it's important to say that with our CIT folks, there's a lot of other police agencies in Philadelphia that we interact with. Um, and a lot of those folks have asked to be a part of our CIT. So I make available so many seats in each, every class for either a University of Penn, Temple, uh, SEPTA, or any other law enforcement agencies that really want to be a part, I'll make that accommodation for them. But we have quite a few. We probably have the most number of CIT trained officers than any other department. But and I'll get the exact percentage. I just don't have it off the top of my head. No, that's okay. Um, and is CIT training voluntary or mandatory for certain units? Well, it raises a good point. Some people have argued that this should be mandatory if it's so great. The issue is um, in the CIT model, I mean, we're replicating a model, and there is actually a CIT International. <clears throat> this is not just a Philadelphia program. Uh, we have never, it is a voluntary program up front, uh, but we have never had a shortage of officers since 2007. So uh, on that premise, it's, it's a setback. Having people in a class that want to be in a class, um, like I said, because this is very intense training, and we really go through a lot of scenario training. These are officers that want to step up and we've never had a shortage of them. If that time came where we didn't have officers volunteering, uh, we would revisit the mandatory concept of it. But the people that train, do this training is not Philadelphia police officers. Actually, I'm the only police officer that actually speaks to the individuals. Uh, it's all outside individuals uh, who have really bought into the CIT model of volunteers uh, and they really enjoy the, the quality of the class because they are volunteers. So uh, right now we we have classes every, every month. I have 30 some odd officers chomping at the bit to get in the class. So until that time that we don't have any, then we'll revisit uh, voluntary versus mandatory. Mm -hmm. And then um, how many hours of training is it? It's 40 hours, 40 a whole hours. week. Okay. And then do they have to repeat it 
regularly? It's they don't get it, certification or anything, right? It, it's not a well. See, certifications are problematic sometimes because mm -hmm. if suddenly after two years you're you're still able to deescalate things. So what we do is we uh, we have a two we have a refresher requirement. So we'll, we'll, what we do is we, we use a, a certain model for the de-escalation. So every two years, officers will get a refresher, just bringing it to the forefront of, you know, the whole process that we use for de-escalation. We use a very simple model, but it's very effective and it mirrors really how they handle most assignments. So it's been incredibly effective. So we'll do a refresher. And then if there's any like hot button issues uh, for the last couple of years, it's been um, you know, obviously returning vets and making sure that our officers are in tuned with the special needs of, of that uh, population. But yeah, we have a two-year refresher requirement. Okay, it's a so is the refresher mandatory or is it also voluntary? You, you uh, called it a requirement, so I'm it's a requirement to... if you want to maintain being a CIT officer. Okay, got it. That's helpful. Um, that's that's exactly what I wanted to hear. Um, thank you. And do you know if is d domestic violence training incorporated into the CIT training? Uh, domestic violence specifically, no. But we're talking the bigger pictures of crisis. So the, we, we have in some of the scenarios that we do, there are domestic related scenarios, but we don't necessarily distinguish the crisis between uh, a domestic related crisis versus uh, a mental health related crisis. So the answer is not specifically the answer. No, but it's uh, the issue of crisis is, is covers all the gambit of all the crises that my officers are will potentially face. I know there's at least three scenarios uh, that they go through that are they're domestic, but they have to do with people in crisis. There's a mother, father, and a brother, sister scenario, I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, so I just wanted to clarify, um, you know, you mentioned about, um, I, I mentioned that my colleagues and I have been very invested in the mobile crisis response, the mental health response mental health crisis response units through DBH. Um, you had noted um, that, you know, in, in response, there's co-responder CIT. Now, with the CIT response, that is a police officer with CIT training. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then the co-responder model is a officer with a civilian. Is that correct? That's correct. Who is, the officers, trained, who is a formal trained yes, the officer? The officer will be a CIT trained officer with a civilian who has uh, obviously a uh, civilian mental health specialist. Uh, and what happens is we give those that team an additional 40 hours of training with additional scenarios. And how many of those teams do you have, the co responder teams? Right now, it's only a, a four, um, as we've mentioned in other hearings. Uh, to, Chief Inspector Cram is creating uh, the a new behavioral health unit that will be rolling this whole process in addition to our police assistant diversion program. So he'll be expanding it in the near future when promotions can be made. Okay, so I just wanted to clarify, and um, you do not currently have a timeline on that expansion? Um, well, I, I can't speak out of school. I believe it's rather, I mean, this is a priority of the police commissioner. So the issue is right now just um, with the shortage of personnel that we have is when we make promotions, we have a sufficient people that we can dedicate to the program. But the chief has already said he'd make accommodations with his own bureau to make sure he can staff this unit to get it up and running as soon as possible. But I, if I can touch about uh, your other subject very quickly is the, with the police radio and our partners with uh, behavioral health and intellectual disabilities. Um, they have embedded and will be embedding in the future navigators within our police radio. Those navigators are in a perfect world. We don't need a police response to every call. Uh, what we're trying to do is how do you differentiate what a, where a police officer is needed and how do you differentiate somebody else? So we actually are going to be embedded uh, uh, crisis trained civilians from DBHIDS will be embedded with the additional skills that we might be able to offshoot some of these calls to an individual navigator who can then try to negotiate, not negotiate, but uh, speak with these individuals to see what they actually need. Now, if they actually need a police response, they're in police radio, it's just, you know, push the button and cops are on their way. But the other avenue is this, I know um, uh, Dr. Bowen is, is doing tremendous work, is trying to ex expand the um, the whole uh, mobile emergency teams where in, in a perfect world, that navigator can then say, I don't need a police officer here. I'm going to send the mobile emergency team. And that's, that's the vision that we're, we're heading towards. So we'll be able to 
all shoot things out of police radio to actually a fully civilian response or a quasi civilian response with the uh, CERT teams. So we're looking for a multiple avenue approach on how we can address people in crisis, which includes domestics and people with mental health issues, drug and alcohol issues. Um, so there'll be a multiple way of approaching rather than just uniform police showing up. And that's, that's the work that's underway. Okay. And do you meet regularly with DBH IDS to coordinate this or how often do you meet with them? <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to, I hope my folks, my partners don't take this the wrong way, but we meet an awful lot. Okay. okay. We, have, okay. we have meetings and multiple meetings. And so there's a lot of coordination and the managing director's office is really key uh, connecting us together and is actually a, a big part of this coordination and collaboration. Yeah. So a number of us have been really supportive of this area and we want to keep working um, with uh, with all of with you. We, we work very closely with DBH IDS, but, you know, we believe that uh, we were able to get, again, this number of four, which is very small, but um, four mobile uh, mental health crisis response units off the ground with DBH IDS. Um, and, you know, it's certainly our belief that we could probably do four per police district at this point, you know, um, because that's what we're hearing from, from the ground about in terms of needs. And ideally that should relieve some things off of you. Um, my last question is whether you could share the, oh yes. My last question is whether you could share the app. Can we be brief on this one, if you don't yes. mind? Yes. Uh, the, my last question is uh, whether you could send over the average caseload for the for domestic violence detectives. I'm sorry. Could I get the question again? It's going in and out. Caseload. Yeah. What is the caseload currently average? What is the average caseload for a uh, detective in your domestic violence division sure i could i could get you that i don't know if i have that but just looking looking back um uh, it's not just one detective in many of the divisions it's it's two teams so it would be up to four detectives in some of the divisions and and it fluctuates i mean in some of the divisions it, it could go from being just over a thousand cases per year to other divisions where they have uh, several thousand. And when I say cases, like I said, somebody's could be stalking, they could involve, you know, uh, unwanted text messages, social media, um, you know, threats, all the way up to an actual physical assault or an argument or something that brought them into the detective division. So there, there we, we do, I do have some numbers on investigations that I could send you and break it up to how many those teams handle. If they get overwhelmed, some of them investigations could be shifted to our what we call our line squad or the other investigators that work in that division to assist. Um, but we try to prioritize those. It's always been the way. I've been in the detective bureau over half my career, 32 years, and uh, we always prioritize these kind of investigations. Okay. They, the numbers initially sound pretty overwhelming, so we'd love to see the caseload. So thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, those are all my questions. Uh, thank you very much. And um, Councilman, if you want to do a second round as we move forward, just let me know. I just want to make sure I get um, other members in as well. Councilman Isaiah Thomas. Councilman Isaiah Thomas. He may have stepped away. I want to also acknowledge the presence of um, Councilman Allen Don. Any other questions or comments from members of the committee for this panel? Councilman Gim, do you have anything you want to wrap up on? I think I covered my space, Council Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Well, um, Frank and Francis. I'm sorry, Councilman your... Johnson. Mr. Chair. Yes. I just had yes. one question, and I apologize. I was having a technical issue, and you might have answered this because I lost service for a second. But I, first of all, um, um, good morning, Inspector Haley, as well as um, the other officers involved. Thank you for your service. Um, I'm wondering, um, when we're talking about domestic violence, and I heard how you now categorize it, which is, is uh, very informative, we, in violence in general, we've seen an uptake in a number of uh, young people who commit uh, crimes, as well as the victims. So I'm wondering, in the midst of you uh, analyzing the numbers, um, do we see an increase in the impact it has on, on our children, whether they're the victim, the culprit, or the person experiencing the trauma? That, that is my only question. I apologize for the delay, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. 
Well, one of the things I want to say is I, I talked a lot about specialization, and uh, when it comes to children uh, and domestic violence, those cases are handled by our special victims unit, not the divisional detectives. Now, these these detectives are all very specially trained in handling that. Uh, they're co-located, as you know, with DHS. Um, so we're very, we're working hand to hand with Children's Alliance when interviews have to be done, especially with small children. Um, we always we follow the, the the best practices. We give them some time. Children Alliance does a forensic interview, and then we can move forward to see what the issues are and make sure that we're all in line uh, with our actions. Uh, looking through the pandemic, um, the pandemic time, especially ki crimes against children, um, you know, a lot of our third party um, reports decreased during that time because people were isolated. Uh, but normally in pre-pandemic years, uh, we have a lot of third party reports talking about children being victimized or children being um, uh, subject to this kind of violence. And we immediately uh, start an investigation and make sure that we cover all bases. So uh, in these things, some of it dropped during the pandemic, and that may be just because reports dropped. So we're constantly doing follow up and making sure that our partners are all online. If there's any other issues, if schools are talking to us, uh, if anybody else talks, said during the pandemic, we didn't get much from schools because they weren't there. So, uh, but we're constantly monitoring that very closely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, very much. thank you, Councilman Isaiah Thomas. Any other questions or comments from members of the committee for this panel? Okay, hearing none. Um, thank you, Frank, and thank you, Francis. Um, for your presentation, very, very informative. And could you, Frank, please make sure you follow with the information requested by Councilman Helen Gim from members of the committee. Thank you. Very good. Will the Thank clerk you. please call the, you're welcome. Will the clerk please call the next panel? On our next panel, we have Ruth Glenn, Spencer Cantrell, and Susan, Dr. Susan B. Sorensen. I actually believe our first panelist, Ruth Glenn, has not logged in yet, so if possible, we will begin with Spencer Trell. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Good morning, Chairman and Council Members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Spencer Cantrell, and I'm the Director of Federal Affairs at the Educational Fund to Stop Gun Violence. Prior to this role, I was the Legal and Advocacy Director for a domestic violence organization that served the greater Washington region, including D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. During my career, I've represented hundreds of survivors and managed staff working with individuals who've experienced domestic violence, sexual assault, dating violence, and stalking. And in my current role at the Ed Fund, we use a public health and equity lens to identify and implement evidence-based solutions and programs to reduce gun violence in all its forms. I wanted to share today a few best practices, emerging trends, and innovative ideas to improve services for victims and survivors of domestic violence. At the Ed Fund, we work with several jurisdictions around the country to identify gaps in services and how to improve the continuum of services for survivors, often, like the first panel discussed, through collaboration and communication among service providers. We know that firearms and domestic violence are a lethal combination. Nearly half of all women murdered in the U.S. are killed by a current or former intimate partner, and more than half of those homicides are by firearm. Research has shown that access to firearms is one of the most significant risk factors for domestic violence homicide. Ensuring that firearms are taken away from all abusers is critical to protecting survivors, law enforcement, and entire communities, since research shows that domestic abusers are more likely to commit mass shootings, and law enforcement killed in the line of duty are most often killed by domestic abusers. There are some concrete changes to ensure that abusers do not have access to lethal means, and protecting survivors. Joshua and Brett, if you don't mind sharing that attachment from the bottom of my, my testimony, I'd greatly appreciate it. Um, Just give me one moment, sorry. Thank you. Um, while they're pulling that up, one recommendation is to provide a worksheet to survivors with pictures of firearms so that it's easy for them to identify what firearms the defendants may possess. And they're going to show you an example of that in just a moment. Um, this is something that we've seen used in other jurisdictions so that even if victims and survivors can't name the kinds of firearms that the defendants have, they're able to identify them for law enforcement to help with the retrieval process. And I'll, I'll keep going while they're pulling that up. Um, so I'll keep going. 
No, I know how technology is. So additionally, um, there also need to be a clear processes and procedures for ensuring that law enforcement complete a thorough investigation when a firearm is purportedly possessed. Too often in my experience have law enforcement taken a respondent at their word with lethal consequences. Furthermore, I've spoken with law enforcement who deem the contents of the petition as weak or not serious, but if the judge has granted an order, then law enforcement need to complete comprehensive investigations regardless of their understanding of the severity of the abuse included in the petition. Law enforcement also need to refer cases to the district attorney for criminal contempt and warrants if necessary. Um, in the judiciary, there are some additional recommendations I would make. In one jurisdiction where I previously practiced, the judge's worksheet for issuing domestic violence protection orders had the firearms removal box pre-checked. This preempted the possibility of deadly clerical errors. The Ed Fund has also seen jurisdictions experience success when the ju judici judiciary regularly holds review hearings to ensure that the PFA is being followed and that respondents have in fact surrendered their firearms. These status hearings can, can really be uh, empowering for survivors as well. The state of Pennsylvania has already made great strides at improving service delivery. As was discussed about Act 79, the creation of PFAD increased coordination and communication among service providers, but more can be done to improve collaboration. If an order is served or if law enforcement are having issues with the service of process, the ongoing communication between law enforcement and survivors, often with the assistance of victim assistants or advocates, is critical to ensuring that those orders are in place. One possible strategy to assist with notification of victims is the VINE protective order system, which automatically sends survivors text, emails, or phone calls to inform them when an order has been served or firearms relinquished so they can safety plan accordingly, often with trained advocates. And I have a link to more information about the VINE protective order system in my written testimony. Since leaving an abusive relationship is often the most dangerous time, this notice is imperative for effective safety planning. I'd also note that the city of Philadelphia is richly diverse, and like other communities, it is important to pay special attention to ensuring that services are accessible to all members of the community. Some community members may be reticent to report abuse to law enforcement for a variety of well-documented and understandable reasons. When trust in law enforcement is eroded, this can make it harder for survivors to engage with systems. Having survivor-centered, culturally specific, and trauma-informed systems is critical to ensuring that victim services are accessible by everyone, including Black, Indigenous, people of color, as well as LGBTQ survivors, religious minorities, immigrants, and individuals with disabilities. I would also encourage the city of Philadelphia to assess how these cases are being handled by race, zip code, and socioeconomic status. Too often communities of color are over-policed while survivors still are not able to access the justice they are looking for. Last night, the U.S. Senate passed the Violence Against Women Act reauthorization in the 2022 Omnibus Budget Bill. There are many great highlights in this legislation, including services for survivors who were incarcerated and returning to their communities, specific attention to marginalized communities, and exploring restorative justice as a potential means of addressing domestic violence. These are all best and emerging practices I wanted to flag for you today. Additionally, even those who are not culturally specific providers, including law enforcement, judges, district attorneys, and victim advocates, should demonstrate a commitment to delivering culturally responsive services and being equitable, as well as ongoing training to ensure that services are culturally responsive to meet the needs of survivors. Thank you for sharing this attachment on the screen. This is just a very simple example of a worksheet that could be included with the, the PFA so that it's easier for survivors to identify what firearms uh, a respondent or defendant would have to help law enforcement with the, the collection of those firearms. Another remedy that might be outside the scope of what Philadelphia can consider but worth exploring as a state are extreme risk protective orders. ERPO laws vary by state, but they allow other individuals, such as law enforcement or mental health professionals, to petition to have firearms removed temporarily while someone is undergoing a period of crisis. ERPOs are modeled after domestic violence restraining orders and could serve to be quite useful in other cases where firearms need to be removed. Lastly, I would encourage the city of Philadelphia to ensure that there is a thorough fatality review process for all firearm homicides, including domestic violence. 
by bringing together law enforcement, the sheriff's department, the judiciary, the district attorney's office, pretrial services, parole and probation, victim advocates, members of the bar, public health officials, and other community members, the city of Philadelphia could better assess gaps in services and improve continuums of care to prevent future homicides. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. I'm available for any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Spencer, for your very informative presentation. Um, we're going to do the, we're going to listen to the other two panelists, and then we'll ask questions of all three of you together. Well, the next panelist, please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. The next panelist is Ruth Glenn. Good morning, Ruth. Good morning. Um, thank you so much, Spencer, for that wonderful presentation. Um, you've pretty much taken the words out of my mouth. <laughs> Um, my name is Ruth Glenn. I am the um, Chief Executive Officer of the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and I've been invited to speak to you really briefly um, about the importance of addressing firearms and domestic violence. Um, and as Spencer said, with a congratulatory note that uh, the Violence Against Women Act passed last night, um, which has been about four to five years in, in the making, um, and I should say the reauthorization, which um, really helps address what Spencer talked about, which is not only when we're addressing firearms and domestic violence, we need to make sure that we're coming from a place that is survivor-centric, and um, that includes um, our Native American uh, sisters and brothers and our LGBTQIA communities and on and on and on. Um, and this VAWA helps us make sure that we meet survivors where they are. Um, unfortunately, we also lost a small battle, and I call it a small battle simply because, I um, shouldn't say the word battle, but I do, um, it, it simply because um, though we haven't given up, we have to take it on again, which is uh, this VAWA, this Violence Against Women Act bill, does not include what we had hoped to be uh, closing the boyfriend loophole. And what that means is that we still have survivors who will not be covered under this VAWA uh, because they're dating or they have other types of relationships, stalking, um, that could have been covered uh, uh, close, we could have closed the gap in the boyfriend loophole in regards to firearms removal and um, that kind of thing. But um, the messaging is is that it's not gone away forever um, and that we can continue that, that effort to make sure that that happens. Uh, the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence has made this a priority um, for the past eight years, which is whatever we're going to do to address the issue of firearms and domestic violence, we are there um, in policy program and projects. Uh, as uh, Spencer outlined, the lethality that can occur is disturbing. Um, and without going into a whole lot of data, which Spencer did a very good job covering, um, we have got to do better at ensuring that survivors are safe from firearms, and that includes um, enforcement of laws, that includes removal, that includes also making sure that entities have resources to be able to do that. I, what we hear most frequently, though, though we encourage people to, to find ways to make it happen, is the um, inability to enforce, the inability to store, uh, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, so on two levels, uh, we will continue our efforts, which is closing the gap of the boyfriend loophole and then making sure that jurisdictions, communities uh, can respond in a way that is survivor centric, making sure that uh, there is no further risk uh, in domestic violence. Domestic violence is harmful as it is. When you introduce a firearm into a situation in which an abuser is hurting someone, um, it become can become lethal pretty quickly. Um, so, with all of that said, I just wanted to uh, say that uh, you know we got Baba across the line, uh, but our work does not end there, and particularly on this particular issue. Uh, we will continue to do what we can as a national coalition, particularly on policy, in ensuring that that gap is closed and that it, it further assists local jurisdictions and communities in how they can respond to this because we know that it's very difficult 
So what can we do from a national perspective? That. Um, so with that, I, I welcome questions as well. Uh, thank you all so much for the work that you're doing and having this hearing on this very, very important topic. Thank you. I think we have one more panelist before questions. Brett, did the last panelist? Yep. Um, our last panelist, uh, our last speaker on this panel is Dr. Susan B. Sorensen. Oh, Susan. Yeah, I saw Susan yes. earlier. Hello. Come on. Uh, good. Um, thank you for inviting me to join you today. Um, I've conducted research on violence against women, gun violence, and the intersection of the two for over three decades. And since coming to Philadelphia and the University of Pennsylvania, after being at the U UCLA School of Public Health, I've worked with local government agencies and nonprofit organizations to better understand what they and the women of Philadelphia face. What I'm going to be saying this morning is a somewhat shorter version of the written testimony that was provided to you. Okay. And I'm going to offer four items for your consideration this morning that will focus on women's lives as well as their deaths. And each is predicated on you encouraging city agencies to implement and enforce the existing policies regarding guns, domestic violence, and the use of guns in domestic violence. First, encourage, if not in direct, law enforcement agencies responding to domestic violence incidents to ask whether a gun is involved. And I'll explain why that's important. But second, improve information collection and dissemination. For example, the gun record keeping by the Philadelphia Police Department and the domestic violence and gun case tracking within the district attorney's office. Third, to allocate funding for the development and evaluation of gun relinquishment procedures related to domestic violence. Sounds like there's some good ones in place. We need to know if they're working as designed. And fourth, to advocate for policy changes. Uh, for example, Pennsylvania does not have a law specific to intimate partner violence, misdemeanor assault, which is directly relevant to the DV gun laws. And I'll come back to that. The previous speakers have talked about the two federal laws on misdemeanors for domestic violence and for restraining orders known in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania as protection from abuse orders. Um, so I'm not going to go into that. What I do want to add to that is that we know that abusers with a gun, more than abusers in general, create environment of fear in the home. The resulting fear, based in reality, spills over to everyone in the home. That's because they most often use a gun. We know from our work here in Philadelphia, not to shoot or shoot at their partner, but to threaten and intimidate her. They actually are less likely to hit or punch her because they don't need to in order to get what they want. They have a gun. These laws have important implications, and it's relatively easy to implement and enforce the purchase restrictions on firearms that are related to domestic violence. Um, but like I said, Pennsylvania makes it a bit harder uh, by not having a law specific to the intimate partner violence. Changing that is one of my recommendations to you. It's important to make it easy for people and agencies to do what we require of them. And when you do, be sure to include boyfriends, the most common abuser in Philadelphia, as well as nationally. Relinquishment is another story. They're supposed to be instructed when a DV restraining order is issued or they're convicted of a misdemeanor DV. They're supposed to be instructed to relinquish any firearms they might have. And as Inspector Healy mentioned earlier, if there was a registry, it would be easy to see whether the abuser does that. A parallel can be drawn to motor vehicles. If someone's instructed to relinquish their vehicle, authorities can check registration to see if they did. But there is not a registry for guns. So courts can tell an abuser to relinquish guns, but have no way to check whether that actually happens. And it's also not clear whether the abusers are 
are ordered to do so. <clears throat> in essence, relinquishment is part of the policy that needs more work. So that's another of my recommendations to you. I encourage you in your allocations to reduce gun violence in the city, to allocate funding for the development and evaluation of DV-related gun relinquishment. A few years ago, I conducted research about gun use and domestic violence incidents that were responded to by Philadelphia police officers. And I'm delighted to be here today with Inspector Fran Healy because he was one of the people who helped facilitate that, um, had it been um, referred to or referenced earlier uh, with Deputy Commissioner Pat Fox, work that began under Commissioner Ramsey and occurred, uh, continued under Ross. Okay. The work was difficult because officers in the field did not have handheld devices and paper forms were the sole source of information about the incidents. That said, through our work, we learned that the Philadelphia police officers responded to more than 35,000 incidents of intimate partner violence in the city in one year. A great majority of the incidents involved no external weapon, that is, no knife, no bat, no gun, no any other object. But when an external weapon was used, however, one in every three of those weapons was a gun. It might not have been shot, and it might not have been fired. As I said, the great majority of the incidents involved a threat with the gun, information that would not be available to you in the data that were presented at the very beginning of this hearing. Pennsylvania mandates the removal of weapons at the scene of domestic violence under certain circumstances. And our patrol officers don't do a very good job of that, according to the reports that the department policy mandates them to complete and file. Maybe they actually do do a good job, but their documentation of it can be improved. That's another of my recommendations. Do what's in your power and authority to improve information about guns and intimate partner violence when it comes to the city agencies, such as the police department, the district attorney's office, and hopefully the courts. That includes gathering information within those units and disseminating it outside them. With more complete knowledge, you and others can make better decisions. My final recommendation is for you to encourage, if you can direct the police department to require officers responding to domestic violence calls to ask whether a firearm was involved, even when it was not fired. As we know through research and practice, as well as from our own personal experiences, people who are stressed sometimes forget to volunteer important information, asking directly will help us understand how big the problem is and increase vital information by which to help increase safety in Philadelphia. In closing, when talking about domestic violence and firearms, women who are killed are typically the focus. I urge you to expand that perspective the women and children who live each day with an abuser also merit your immediate attention to protect them from the trauma he create, creates. Thank you again for inviting me to your questions. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Susan, for your very informative uh, presentation. Um, before I turn over to Councilman Curtis Jones, I wanted to ask Ruth um, for... I know you do a lot of national policy work. Give me your two to three recommendations that you think that we could support on a local level, um, even if that's advocating with our congressional representatives um, to be to pay attention to what just took place yesterday in terms of um, the the Violence Against Women Act passing, but yet the exclusion of the boyfriend component excluded. So any recommend, additional recommendations that you think we can advocate for from a city level on up? 
So, um, first of all, it is so good to see you, Susan. How are you? Um, I haven't seen her in a very long time. Um, so I would say that uh, the recommendations that Susan offered are right on point. We too often forget that we can do things as a preventive measure if we're asking the right questions, which is, I know you're very upset right now, is there a gun in the home? Too often we react when something lethal has happened or it's escalated to a point where we're fearful that someone's going to quote unquote die. Um, but the terror and the trauma that happens when a gun is present and there's domestic violence uh, cannot be measured, quite frankly. Um, you see a lot more, um, I shouldn't say it that way. Um, we have the ability to stop it before it gets to that point. So the recommendations that Susan has made, uh, Dr. Sorensen has made, are, are right on point. And they really are from a pre preventive perspective. And really talking about what does it mean to, to those that are impacted in domestic violence um, situations where somebody is hurting another person and there's a gun present. Um, as a survivor of gun violence and, and domestic violence, I'll let you know that it, you know, just having the presence there was um, more trauma than um, some instances of the physical violence, quite frankly. Um, just knowing that the quick pull of a trigger can uh, end your life is all you need um, for an abuser to have control. So other than what, what uh, Dr. Sorensen has outlined and, and uh, Spencer has talked about, uh, and from a prevention angle, uh, I, I think those are fantastic. And in fact, I support those recommendations wholly. Thank you. And Spencer, I just want to thank you um, for your recommendations as well. One thing that really st stuck out is in regards to the social equity component, and really doing a deeper dive on who's actually receiving um, the level of support and services, which I think is very, very, um, very, very critically important. Um, particularly when, you, when it comes to addressing this issue, any level of attention that's giving, and most importantly, the level of urgency, right? Not just something that you get a phone call that, oh, well, you know, we're in, you know, this part of South Philadelphia, not as big of a deal when we're in the Northeast part of Philadelphia. And so I thank you for highlighting that. And that's something we'll definitely do additional follow up on. I want to um, call on the chair of public safety who also has been um, advocating and working around this issue. Councilman Curtis Jones. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, one is statistical. How many PFAs, protection from abuse orders, get ignored um, throughout the system? If there are statistics on that, um, that's number one. And then how do we, in, in, in all murders are not the same. One size does not fit all. And some of them you can predict more easily than others. Um, when we see back and forth Facebook beef uh, between rival neighborhoods, you can predict that there might be retaliatory strikes, ret ret retaliation and shootings. How do we get better at saying that if an individual commits um, an abuse that we kind of track that a little better. We don't let them ignore um, the PFAs uh, and, 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 and can better protect citizens from people who say they love them. So the first part of the question is how many PFA orders get ignored? Dr. Susan? Um, I'll just weigh in here to say that I don't even know if we know how many PFAs are issued, let alone ignored. Um, I've been interested in doing work on PFAs here in Philadelphia and the way things are written, researchers are specifically prohibited from using any of the information in the databases. 
That's what Pennsylvania law says, and that's how the policy has been interpreted. Um, so I would love to be able to answer those questions. I did work on hundreds of thousands of PFAs when I was in California, and I could tell you how many had guns. I could tell you by linking gun databases that California had, how many were getting guns while they were under a PFA. Pennsylvania does not have either of those things. California is sort of unique yeah. in that way, but that information just isn't available, so I can't answer any, any of your questions. Maybe somebody, I mean, that's part of my recommendation uh, to you all to say, to encourage you to say, You've got to improve your tracking That's within right. the DA's office, police department, and the court system to be able to address questions like that because we don't have that vital information at this point in time. As a father, as a father of daughters, as a, a brother to sisters, you get caught up in that whole, I, you know. He says he loves me abuse cycle. And it, it's almost frustrating to see often, and I don't have statistical validation for this, but how often some guys say, oh, I, you know, I don't care what you write. I'm going here for a number of false reasons that they claim. And all of them are emotional. So as we do the 100 shooter review, we. I have to find a way, Mr. Chairman, to better figure out how many times people just totally ignore the paper, ignore the protection order, and then find a way. I, I believe gun confiscation is one way, um, but there, there have to be others uh, to, protect, to protect people. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments from members of, from members of the panel? If I may, uh, I would love Dr. to Susan. show you. Yeah, thank you. I would love to show you two illustrations. Um, Brett has the those in it. Brett, if you could pull up slide one, and then yeah. later slide three. One. Sorry, it is loading. So one moment. Kurt, this is probably one of the most uh, informative uh, presentations we've had with actual recommendations to follow. So I want to thank my panelists for that. Okay. The first image that I want to show you is a cartoon by Pulitzer Prize, the late Pulitzer Prize winning Tony Auth, who was with the Philadelphia Inquirer for many, many years. And the idea of trying to solve the gun violence problem, we're all coming at from different angles. And that was an important thing because the police officers and inspectors started by saying, this is a small portion of the gun violence problem which is absolutely right in terms of fatalities. Okay. But the reality is they are defining it as domestic violence and including a wide range of things. And the two council members who've just spoken pointed out so importantly that what happens between roommates, what happens to between brothers, what happens to be, uh, between cousins is different than what happens between intimate partners. And that's why it's important that we have a, an additional statute, not one to substitute, but an additional statute that looks at intimate partner domestic violence okay, for the state. Because as a researcher, there are times I want to use a certain definition, but everybody else uses a different one. And the police use a definition of domestic violence that is largely different than what everybody else uses. So I hope that we can make it easier for the officers to do what we need to do sometimes and what I've done in my research. I then go on and provide the information 
of what I think is important to de define it, but I also provide it in the way that everybody else thinks about it, what regular people think about it, what policy members think about it. So when we talk about domestic violence, most people think intimate partners. They don't think roommates. They don't think cousins and all of that. And so we are have been at this impasse for a long, long time. When we ask for information from law enforcement about this, they provide a huge range because that's what law enforcement, that's how it's defined on the federal level. And so they need to do it that way. But if we can do it in an additional way, we can help reduce some of this confusion. And the, sec the last slide, please, Brett. It's gonna take a lot to end gun violence. And if you focus only on fatalities, it's a, it's a small piece of what people live with. That's right. And it's an important piece of what people live with. When we hear about 12 year olds on the streets of Philadelphia with guns, where do you think they first saw those? And so if we look at the size of the fatalities, it might be a small piece in terms of numbers, but I would assert it's a crucial piece. It's the piece that pulls so much together so that we can help solve this problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Then Councilman Jamie Gaudier. No, I don't have a question. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I had a miss um, communication in the chat. All right. If there is no questions or comments from uh, any, any additional questions or comments from members of the panel, I want to thank all of you for uh, this very, very informative uh, presentation, very informative testimony. And we're going to do a deep dive and see how we can follow up on some of these recommendations that, that are within our power. And so um, thank you and keep fighting a good fight. Will the clerk please call the next panel? Our next panel is Joanna Otero Cruz and Teresa White Walston. Hey, Joanna. Hi, Council Member. Welcome back. Yes, yeah, great to be back. Buenas tardes. Um, good afternoon. My name is Joanna Otero Cruz. I am the Executive Director and President of Women Against Abuse. Um, I have a colleague here with me, Elise Sosha, our Policy Director and Chief of Staff, and we are honored to be here today. On behalf of Women Against Abuse and the survivors of domestic violence we serve, I want to thank Council Member Johnson, as well as all the members of the Special Committee of Gun Violence Prevention for calling this hearing and inviting Women Against Abuse to participate. We know that, like most members of our community, City Council has been personally impacted by domestic violence, and we appreciate your continued advocacy on this issue. The importance of this hearing and the connection between gun violence and domestic violence cannot be overstated. Gun violence in Philadelphia is no secret, but domestic violence still seems to be. We hear about shootings and homicides regularly on the news, but until it becomes fatal, rarely do we hear about the many insidious incidents of domestic violence that are happening in our homes, in our community, every day. Intimate partner violence is incredibly common. It impacts one in four women and one in 10 men. Here in Philadelphia, on average, the police receive more than 100,000 calls, domestic related calls to 911 each year. That is almost 300 a day. With rising rates of violence in our city, it is no surprise that domestic violence homicides have also increased. According to the Philadelphia Inquirer, the number of homicides classified as domestic violence in our city has more than doubled this year, from 18 domestic violence homicides in 2020 to 42 in 2021. 
This is the highest levels of domestic violence homicides in Philadelphia's recent history, at least since 2008 when Women Against Abuse began tracking it. Guns are the primary cause of domestic violence homicide. Nearly 1 million women alive today have been shot or been shot at by an intimate partner. And black women are twice likely to be fatally shot by an intimate partner compared to white women. And we know that intimate partner homicides don't just impact the immediate victim, but that one in five homicide victims are family members like children or friends or people who try to intervene, including first responders. This past year, at the leadership of Councilmember Brooks, Philadelphia took a um, step forward in defining domestic violence through the lens of co um, coercive control, a pattern of controlling behaviors, and it is important to understand the role of guns in this pattern. Just the sheer presence of a gun in domestic violence situations increased the risk of homicides in women by 500%. It is used as a threat, a tool of power, a symbolic weapon even if the trigger is never pulled. In Philadelphia, studies showed an ar a firearm was used to threaten or coerce a partner 69% of time, but only fired 10% of the cases. The use of a gun to threaten a partner is a key predictor of lethality. While the city searches for solutions to rising levels of gun violence in our community, we would be remiss not to prioritize and support efforts to prevent domestic violence as means to reduce overall gun violence and vice versa. Efforts to prevent gun violence will reduce the overall prevalence of domestic violence in our community. At the federal level, we are asking our legislator, le, le, sorry, legislators to strengthen background checks and close deadly firearm gaps like what's already been mentioned, the boyfriend loophole. At the local level, we have made strides since enacting the Landmark Act 79 in 2018. And now our charge is to ensure implementation is comprehensive and effective. And we have an opportunity as a community to invest in significant prevention measures like our telephone outreach program, connecting advocates to high-risk victims of abuse, and our SAFER program, educating our youth, our young people in our schools about healthy relationships, about nonviolent communications, and warning signs of abuse. Gun violence is preventable. Domestic violence is preventable. Today's hearing is a critical piece of advocacy, and we hope it is just the start of a conversation about the intersection of these two evils. Again, I want to thank you for um, close attention to this issue. We look forward to continue partnership with you and, and all to make our community safer for all Philadelphians. Thank you. Thank you very much. Will the next panelists introduce themselves and state their name for the record and begin? Good morning, Councilman. My name is Teresa White Walston. Um, myself, and I want to just first of all give honor to all of the distinguished members of City Council and my esteemed colleague, Joanna Otero Cruz. Um, I'm really in the least scores job, just wonderful to be able to work with. My, myself and Rachel Copen, we're currently serving as the acting co executive directors of War Philadelphia Center Against Sexual Violence. And we appreciate um, the opportunity to present before you. Uh, we're here to represent the thousands of women, girls, children, and family members whose lives have been affected by the surge of gun violence that has plagued the city of Philadelphia. As Philadelphia's Rape Crisis Center, Although our services are directly connected to preventing sexual harassment, assault, and abuse, and supporting survivors of rape and sexual assault, our clients' lives have been greatly impacted by the ongoing gun violence that is occurring in our city. Over 90% of the survivors we support are women and girls. Our survivors are afraid to leave their homes and travel to attend their much-needed therapy sessions. Children, youth, and parents who participate in our school-based workshops and community-based workshops have often expressed their worries about the incidence of gun violence which is taking place in their neighborhoods. Often, our therapists and education staff 
set aside the goals of either our therapy or educational sessions to make space for our clients and program participants to talk about the impact which gun violence has on their lives, the lives of their families, and in their neighborhoods. War specializes in supporting victims of trauma. Gun violence is one of the most traumatic incidents that any human being can experience or witness. For the 40 women who lost their lives in 2020 and the 60 women who lost their lives in 2021, no amount of words can be said to any of their loved ones that will enable the family members of these women to have closure and move forward with their lives. These women were mothers, sisters, daughters, nieces, and friends of the survivors which we serve at war. I've been informed by my colleagues that our teams actually have an app on their cell phones that show in real time the shooting incidents as they occur. I was also informed that teams have an app on their phones that show the crime scene and the wounds experienced by the victims. While we look to law enforcement to find the perpetrators of gun violence in our city, we must go deeper. The images of actual shootings which are now frequently shown in the media affect those who see these images. Children, youth, and adults who witness these images are further traumatized. What I'm very concerned about is that the images of shootings shown in the media and other public spaces, and particularly the shooting and killing of women and girls, is normalizing this level of violence towards women and girls in our city. To combat violence towards women and girls in general, we have a healthy masculinity initiative at war. And I'm also going to just give acknowledgement and honor to Dr. Susan Sorensen, who is a guru when it comes to the research. Dr. Sorensen noted that this issue is not just about gun violence towards women, it's smaller, it's just a piece. We're at the point now that we need to dive deeper and try to figure out ways to better combat how these public images and the constant uh, viewing of them by children and youth. This is being glorified at this particular point. And I do, again, uh, an acknowledgement to what Joanna has already said. We have programming, and I believe that a lot of programming needs to happen, but there also needs to be a space for men. Men have grown up with trauma in violent communities. They have seen this violence in their lives, experienced it. And we also need to give some more attention. There is attention, but not enough where our young males have an opportunity to talk about the issues that have moved them to this level. When I first started at war, and I was in schools pretty often, and I would see suspension rates high amongst young males, especially young African-American and Latinx males, I used to say to myself, how did this young person get into this situation? We didn't think about trauma then. Our children have grown up in a community where this traumatic event now as adults, they're acting out and doing the same behavior that they have experienced and witnessed. So we need to dive deeper here. It's not just get law enforcement to stop shooting or serve our PSAs. All these are pieces of the puzzle that's needed. We need to also look with our young people and give them something more, some better skills and tools to be able to self-manage behavior. This is just the tip of the iceberg, but I'm asking our, our respectful council to dig deeper. So we, we thank you for providing the funds that you have already provided. We're uh, thrilled about the VAWA Act being passed. We appreciate you giving board an opportunity to come and present our testimony and just to recognize that it's not just our women who lost their lives, it's the family members, it's their children, and it's our community. And we appreciate, uh, everything that city council has done and making this issue something to be tackled and with solutions in this city. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Brett, is there another panelist for this particular panel before opening up for questions? Not on this panel. Okay. Um, the chair recognizes Councilwoman Kendra Brooks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to start, I want to thank uh, Teresa and Joanna for sharing about the connection between uh, coercion control and the use of guns in domestic violence situation. Um, I was really interested in the preventive measures you mentioned to connect the families with advocates early on to teach young people 
how to identify violence in their homes and in their neighborhoods. Can you share a little bit more about how these lessons can be taught in a workshop to young people? Because I think it's a, it's a great measure to undo normalization of violence against women and girls. And what would the young people look for? You know, what people should, young people should look for in intimate partner violence rather than you know, the general uh, interpersonal disputes? Well, Councilwoman, one of the things that I'm going to say, uh, and our agency annually, even in COVID, we did an enormous amount of programs, even through uh, visual, you know, tools. We did actually a thousand school-based services, if you could believe it, even during COVID, when schools, the city of Philadelphia resumed services. And we're very focused on uh, relationship information. And I believe at the core of a lot of this, especially when it comes to our young women, is that very much they're lacking self-esteem. Uh, that might seem like, you know, the textbook answer, but so many of our young women are growing up where in, in, you know, in instability. We recognize that our families are struggling and often our children are not being given the attention that they need to grow and thrive. And especially when it comes to adolescents and teens, those young women will often, and young men, gravitate to any person who is interested in showing them a level of attention. So now that dating partner becomes the, the, the reason for their life, you know, just being, you know, upfront about it. And so that person, this is one of the ways that we've seen a lot of control being gained. So we need to strengthen our young people. I had a chance to serve on another panel and one of the suggestions that we talked about was helping young people determine a life process for themselves, recognizing that they need tools to make better decisions, that they need some competency strengthening so that they can move forward. Our young people are often missing how to determine at the beginning when you're in a dating relationship and the person begins acting out or shows some, you know, um, discontent, they make excuses. Our young women, and I believe Councilman Jones might have spoken to that, they make excuses and accept the bad behavior because they're clinging on to that one individual in their life that is showing them some level of affection. So we need to get back to helping people become whole. We recognize that there's a lot that's missing in their homes or in their communities. And one of the things we try to do internally at WAR is strive through our programming to help young people identify healthy mentors and healthy relationships. Dr. Sorensen is right. DV, dating violence, is just a tip of the iceberg. We know that their ability to have their own personal relationships, to make decisions for their lives, to have a roadmap for, I might be in a community of poverty, but there's a way that I can get out through education and skills. And we do a lot of that at war. That's the only way I know how to help kids stay out of trouble is to give them a roadmap that for success. And I think some strengthening around that. And you know, our young males, I know they are the highest proponent of being the perpetrators and using gun violence, but I am concerned because they, they've been often, and we just transparently, as we've lived our lives, they've just been, you know, cast to the wayside. I don't believe in bad kids. I believe in something that has happened to these children that their lives have gotten out of control and they're now in survival mode. And if you witness violence, you do violence. And it's not just in dating relationships. It's not being able to understand self-management, conflict resolution, all of those basic things that we've done for years, but it seems to somehow not take root that this is the core of what's needed to give young people we know that have missed skills to help them gain skills to better self-manage. Because for me, if it starts out as a bully and nobody checks it, and then it escalates into harassment and nobody checks it, then you become an adult and nobody checks it. And then you get a gun or a knife or some other weapon and now you have lethality. So we've always tried to work with that particular principle. Stop it before it starts. Thank you. I, Joanne, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Thank you, Teresa. I, I definitely concur with what you're saying. I would just add that, you know, again, I think capacity is always an issue also for organizations. While we have curriculums that have been studied, researched for comparable cities such as Philadelphia, you know, capacity is an issue. So, for example, in, in, at WA, um, we start about sixth grade. 
Uh, we do focus on healthy relationships. It's our safer program. It's talking about nonviolent communication, right? There is conflict. People will have conflicts, but you need to be having, you need to have the resource tools to be able to manage that, right? How is that managed? How do you do that in, in a nonviolent way? And, you know, what are the, the warning signs of abuse, right? We, with technology now, we see a lot of stalking behavior that it's something that's you know um just accepted and so no how do you you know talk to young people about healthy relationships establishing you know negotiables and non-negotiables right and so i think that that's really important but i definitely I, mean, I agree with all what you're saying but i do think the capacity is an issue because as an example WA is currently in six schools how many schools do we have in philadelphia so again i think that there definitely needs to be um increased um, opportunities for us to really truly do um, you know prevention work and just greater investment in prevention at a much younger age high school's too late yes it needs to be a part of it but we need to start younger we know our kids are witnessing um, behaviors that may not be as healthy not just in the in their homes but perhaps even in their community obviously trauma is all around us and so we need to uh, begin um, early prevention work the earlier the better oh yes um um yeah i hear that loud and clear and six schools is definitely not enough there's definitely something it should have a larger impact across the district um, um and i did realize that uh, i really like to you know continue to work with you guys on this on with both of you because i think including young people um, in the future is going to be huge. And I just want to thank you for all your work. And um, Mr. Chair, that ends my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, this is very informative. I don't have any questions, but it just gives us additional information to follow up on. Um, I like the comprehensive approach because obviously there's a law enforcement approach but how about being prevented from the beginning right and addressing those behaviors and which what you said Teresa, was very unique is you talked about the men you talked about the boys right they had to learn that behavior from somewhere right it had to become susceptible at some point in time that okay if i'm in a relationship and i have this abusive behavior and i'm also carrying a gun um that that's learned behavior because no no child is born saying hey I want to pick up a gun or I want to bully or I want to threaten someone. So it's, it is um, learned behavior. And so I, I, I thank you and Joanna for taking um, the preventive and comprehensive approach because it does shed light on this issue uh, from a variety of different areas, but basically preventing it in the long run. And so I do thank the two of you. Uh, and I thank my colleague Kendra Brooks also for being on the front line on this issue. This is additional information for us to take back to the city of Philadelphia Office of Domestic Violence because now when I have conversations um, and listening to this hearing, like we could be doing like maybe a media campaign, right, um, around this issue. Um, when you talk about capacity building, okay, well, we have an Office of Domestic Violence. How are we supporting um, and addressing the, what we call boots on the ground organizations such as war and women against abuse uh, when you when it comes to expanding capacity or being an additional support system right around this particular issue and so uh, I, I thank the two of you for taking time out of your schedule um, and I thank you for your informative um, testimony during this panel thank you, you sir. Any other questions? you're welcome any other questions or comments from members of the committee Okay, will the clerk please call the next panel? Our next panel is Shakina Rush and Christine Joy Brunson. Uh, good morning to you all. Uh, good morning, uh, Councilman um, uh, Johnson. Thank you so much for inviting me and um, Good morning to all of the officials that are um, in attendance. My name is Shakina Rush, and I am an overcomer of domestic violence, sex abuse, and sexual assault. Um, I am also the founder and executive director of She Is You, Inc., um, which is an organization that focuses on um, youth intimate partner violence and 
sexual assault and sexual abuse. Um, I'm an overcomer of all three circumstances. Um, so I have firsthand experience of um, all of the issues. And um, so I, I just want to, to, to say, to bring to the forefront, that we are planning um, a Youth Domestic Violence Awareness March um, with the help of Mr. Johnson, uh, April 30th, um, where we are looking to bring resources and community partners together to bring awareness to this issue. And like, as, as many of you um, mentioned, um, you know, we do need to bring this to the forefront. It needs to be public campaigns, like you said, um, because people is like, you know, see no evil, hear no evil. When you're when it's not directly in front of you, it's really not an issue. I mean, even though like I, I see it firsthand within my community, um, you know, I'm from the inner city. Um, I grew up in South Philadelphia where, you know, all of my friends were experienced domestic violence family members, you know, all of the women that I've ever encountered in life, they were dealing with domestic violence. Um, unfortunately, I became more so um, a victim because of an underlying issue from being sexually abused. Um, and those are issues that are always that are also connected to domestic violence and it and it affects the self esteem. Um, like Dr. I believe her name was Dr. Uh, Saranson uh, mentioned. Um, so we we like to try to look at domestic violence as it's just a physical thing, um, but it's not just a physical thing. It's emotional. It's an emotional and mental health issue. Um, it's it's really a threat um, to our communities, especially the African American community in the inner city and within young adults. You know, they think that it's a game. They think that their life can't be threatened because they're not really seeing it. Now, lately and, and more so recently, you know, a lot of young women have been losing their lives um, and it's kind of been almost, you know, publicized, but, um, you know, now it's kind of being brought more to the forefront because it's getting closer and closer to our backyards. And, um, you know, it, 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 we we have to incorporate these these issues within the schools. Like we really have to bring up a um, a curriculum and a program, whereas though they are really being taught early of the um, the signs and how you know um, you become a victim of domestic violence. Um, you know how you know. Um, how it takes two people to be in a domestic violent relationship is not just one sided. Um, so a healthy individual will not remain in an abusive relationship with anyone in any type of form. So, you know, when someone is educated, when they are informed, they're able to, um, to, to counteract or they're able to, you know, react in a positive way that will save, that will potentially save their life or, you know, save the life of the perpetrator. Um, and I have a, you know, a, a small little testimony of um, an individual who witnessed their mother being abused all their life. And now they're uh, servicing a life sentence in jail because they could not deal with the trauma um, from, you know, uh, witnessing their mother being abused by their father. So they in turn committed murder. And, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's an ongoing cycle. Um, and it's something that really, really, really needs to be brought to the forefront, like in every area. Um, you know, oftentimes we have a depiction of a woman that's being abused. She's a middle aged white woman. Uh, we don't really see a lot of representation for young um, African American or Latino uh, individual. So representation is very, very important. Young adults, they listen to other young adults. They listen to people who they can relate to, who reminds them of themselves. So we really need to empower and create a mentorship program where so we are training other young adults to um, interact or, you know, counteract um, these issues. So uh, that's that's my uh, testimony.
standpoint on this issue. Thank you for um, hearing what I had to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Will the next panelist say your name and begin your testimony? Good morning, everyone. My name is Christine Joy Brunson, and I'm the executive director of Purple House Project PA. I'd like to take a moment of silence for all the individuals who have lost their lives to intimate partner violence. Today is an emotional day for me as it's 15 years to the date that my Grammy died from the residual impact of intimate partner violence. For the majority of my life, I witnessed the residual trauma of her abuse. Personal experience coupled with my professional, professional knowledge guided the conception of Purple House Project PA, a local nonprofit with the mission to strengthen, empower, and transition women impacted by intimate partner violence via connection to essential resources that aid in the healing process. Statistics indicate that it takes a person several times before they leave an abusive relationship. Research also shows that the most dangerous time for a victim is when they decide to leave and fatality risk increase with the firearm in the home. To combat, to combat this, Act 79 went into office on April the 10th, 2019. This law includes improvements to Pennsylvania's PFA and deals primarily with increased safety provisions related to firearms in both protection from abuse and misdemeanor crimes of domestic violence to help prevent domestic violence homicide. This act requires defendants to relinquish their firearms in 24 hours instead of 60 days. Knowing this information led Purple House Project PA to host an event titled Protect Yourself. During this event, we have four panelists, a, public, a police officer, a representative from the Central Division of Crime Victim Services, and Council Member Kendra Brooks, as well as um, a Human Resource Director. The event panelists discussed um, the protection from abuse process, coercive control bill, and employment entitlements for individuals impacted by intimate partner violence. Community members that were in attendance shared their concerns with the PFA process. The overarching concern was accessibility. Community members expressed frustrations around the process. Such barriers include transportation, childcare, clothing ins insecurity, anonymity, and accessibility for individuals with visual impairments. Purple House Project PA understands the intersections of intimate partner violence and how those intersections impact an individual's experience with fleeing an abusive relationship. As a result, Purple House Project works with several community partners such as Prevention Meets Fashion, More for More, Collaboration Over Competition, One Day at a Time, and Center for Hope, and a variety of other organizations to address the intersections and assist with eliminating barriers to fleeing an abusive relationship. Based on the aforementioned Purple House Project PA, along with our community partner, Prevention Meets Fashion, believe that the below action should be considered. Digital PFA to assist with accessibility, hotel vouchers for individuals fleeing, partnership with an organization to assist with transportation and childcare after hours. Purple House Project believes that these considerations will greatly assist those who have faced or are facing intimate partner violence. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments from members of the committee? Um, I wanna uh, first, uh, Oh, let me, let me acknowledge Councilman Kendra Brooks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to thank both Christine and Shakina for speaking from their personal experiences and sharing their extremely vulnerable background and now for leading the work to bring our communities forward and hopefully to undo um, intimate partner violence. And I want to give you both the opportunity to elaborate on how to reach the recommendations that you put forward. I, 
I can start. I think that one of the ways that we can reach some of the recommendations is partnering with local organizations that already are helping with transportation, um, as well as maybe having a partnership with SEPTA to assist with transportation. I think another way that we can address some of the recommendations specifically with the digital and making it accessible is to partner with an organization like a technology organization as well as liberty resources that works with people with disabilities to make sure that it is accessible no matter what your ability um, level is yes uh thank you uh council member brooks i appreciate the opportunity uh so i i would suggest that we um that more funding is accessible to grassroots organizations like uh, She Is You and Purple House Project. Um, to us, you know, we want we would like to create opportunities where um, individuals are able to be trained. They're able to be equipped because I mean, the police force already they they are overstrained and overwhelmed. And I mean, not to put someone else in danger, but just to um, be able to um, create, you know, a exit uh, plan to help with, you know, exiting um, a, a dangerous situation. Um, to you know, to be able to provide uh, transportation assistance because you have, you know, individuals where they're fleeing, they're uh, they're fleeing on foot. Um, they don't have no money. They don't have any clothes. So just, you know, being able to um, create a, a, a mobile crisis um, intervention unit, you know, when when a, when a report is made that we need to implement preventative measures right then and there, you know, um, if it's counseling that needs to be done. Like, I remember when I was in my situation and I, we were not married. This was my boyfriend, but this was my living um, partner. And I remember, you know, going through the fight and in the, in the, in the chaos. And I remember feeling like, you know, I wish it was somewhere we could go where we could really talk out uh, our feelings and really figure out what's going on. We both need help. We both needed help. And, and and it's not the point fingers. So I think more, I think, um, like, hubs need to be created, you know, like, around different parts of this where people are able to access easily. Because we have, it's resources, but they're not accessible. I mean, you have to dig and you have to search. And then when you do find them, they're, they're um you know, they, they don't have any funding or, you know, they, they don't have any beds and, you know, so, um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so Sheriff, they don't have Joshua. any beds. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, you know, like there, I mean, the, when you have these crisis centers and, and these organizations like working, they don't have any beds left or, you know, it's only like a, a they'll they'll house the individual, but they're not empowering them or educating them so they can be self-sufficient because domestic violence is just is a symptom of other issues. So we need to come up with plans and, and uh, measures that address all of the issues that lead up to that point. And thank that's, that's all I have. Thank, thank you so much for sharing. That ends my questions, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Um, Christina, Shakina, I want to I wanna thank um, both of you. Shakina, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for being courageous. Thank you for staying on the front line um, regarding this issue. And thank the two of you really for taking a grassroots approach um, and addressing this issue. Because you're on the ground. And so I'm quite sure y'all talk to folks way before they get into law enforcement, way before they go to women against abuse, way before they get to war, because um, you're doing the grassroots work. And so um, oftentimes you're dealing with, with people and meeting them where they're at and doing a referral and the hand holding and the hugging and the supporting, and that's what it's all about. And so I do thank the both of you. Um, Christina, Christine, I have one question. Um, you talked about anonymity, right, with the PUFs. Elaborate, elaborate on that for me. So right now when people go to get their um, PFAs, they have to go to family court. However, um, it's really difficult because what if you see your perpetrator or someone who knows your perpetrator mm. at the PFA mm. court and the safety behind mm. it um, is really impacted by it. And so I think that if there were like 
as a digital portion of it or some alternative places that people can go to get their PFA, it will really help with keeping people safe and anonymous. Um, yeah. uh, okay, very, very, that's very interesting. Okay, we definitely want to keep people safe in the process. Any other questions or comments of members of the committee? Well, listen, y'all keep up the great work. Um, anyway, I can continuously be supportive. Don't hesitate to let me know. She is you. We're going to be doing some collaborations later on in the year. And, and I just um, commend you for not only um, talking about it, but being about it. And it's important that we have a grassroots perspective on the work that we're doing as policymakers, right? Um, it's good to hear your recommendations because we know that you're on the ground and you're closer to the issue than most of us. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for your time, and special thank you to Councilmember at Large Kendra Brooks for inviting us. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you to you all. Thank you. You're welcome. Next, we're going to have um, Sheriff uh, Rochelle Bilal. Just state your name for the record and begin your presentation. How you doing today, Sheriff? Good morning. Can you hear me? Testing one, two, three. Yes, we can hear you. All right. Good morning. Good uh, did. I'm Sheriff sure Rochelle Bilal for the record for the city and county of Philadelphia. So let me introduce my staff that's here that's dealing with a lot of the PFAs and those protection orders and what they're doing. To my left, we have Sergeant Morris, who is our new PFA civil enforcement supervisor that is now out on the streets. Before we did not have that, now we have a supervisor out there when these PFAs are being served or any civil process goes on from the sheriff's office during the day and in the evening. We also have Captain Thornton, who is the captain of the civil enforcement unit. Um, so he makes sure that these from civil enforcement PFAs are all served and information is kept up to date. We have Sergeant Postel, who is part of our training unit and make sure everybody gets trained on these issues and to make sure that everything is run efficient. We also have Officer Sharmatu, who is the expert in our, our relinquished guns, tracking, information, uh, property seats, keeping, our, I just call her the expert, expert in our armory in the sheriff's office. And we also have Officer Dixon, who also works in our armory in the sheriff's office. So these are the two that keep those things um, up to date since we've been in here. It was a mess before, but it's just, if you come in there now, you see that this is the state of the art as far as our armory. Kind of small, so I'll be coming to y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. So we just here to be a part of this. Um, you asked us, so you can ask us any questions. Yes, for what yes, we want to sure. Do. Absolutely. So give me an over overview of, um, and I talked to uh, Francis Haley earlier and Frank Venor, but give me an overview of the sheriff's office in terms of um, court orders related to domestic violence and gun violence? Uh, the court orders? Who does with that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thornton is and to my left. particular sheriff's role, yes. Yes. Can you have him back in the room here? Go ahead, because we're in a small space. We're trying to get this bigger because we had a little connection earlier. Can, let me yes. see if I can make this a little louder. Hold on a second. This is far from good. Okay. All right. Can you repeat that again? Yeah. What is the role of the sheriff's office in the service of court orders related to domestic violence and gun violence? Go ahead. Good morning, Councilman. The sheriff's Good office is to serve temporary PFA orders and set up our weapon relinquishment required simultaneously, even though the defendant is not required to relinquish the weapons right away. We also attempt the orders. Not all, temp not all temporary orders require the relinquishments, but we still go out and attempt to uh, get those weapons. So basically, when the orders come to us, we go out and try to get them all served. Also, we try to, to get the uh, weapons off the street as far as the uh, relinquishments that has the actual orders. So we out there trying to get the, the, the uh, relinquishments and the uh, try to serve the PFAs. That's pretty much what we do, basically. And if the weapon, and if the uh, PFA has the uh, a warrant with it, we have a warrant unit actually try to do the do the uh, serve the warrant, execute the warrant, and also try to serve the PFA at the same time. So that's basically a general 
synopsis of what we do in the sheriff's office. And and give me an overview, Sheriff, of your partnership with other law enforcement agencies, i.e. the Philadelphia Police Department, the District Attorney's Office, regarding uh, the enforcement of protection from abuse orders and that whole process, particularly the relinquishing of the guns. Okay, that's pretty much another part of our, our services. What we do, once that PFA is uh, served, it was given out to the uh, plaintiff, what we'll do is, if it's supposed to be served to another county, it comes to us, meaning the civil division, we'll send that order over to that particular county, whether it's in-state or out-of-state. And what happens is we ask them to send us an affidavit back to us, and then we'll just put it in our file. That's pretty much what we do. If it's generated here in Philadelphia, we'll send it out to those counties or those states in the states. Can he still here? Yeah, he's still Okay, here. all right, good. And what happens is, let's just say if there's an issue with a person that has a, that's a, how can I say, um, that's a registered, that's a registered uh, license to carry a weapon, and we know they have a weapon. If they say that they don't have a weapon, we'll forward that to our gun permit unit with the uh, Philadelphia Police Department, and they'll initiate an investigation so, because we know that they actually have a gun, but they're telling us that they don't have a gun. So now PBD will go and do an investigation, and then they'll go out and do what they need to do from their aspect of it. But, you know, we what we'll do is just try to investigate to find out if they actually have it. If they turn it over to us, fine. But if we actually know that they actually are registered firearm owners, PBD will go and um, initiate an investigation. See, in the process, if we know that they have a gun and they try not to say that they don't want, then they have to sign an affidavit. Basically, if once they sign that affidavit to say they don't have a gun, that goes to PPD investigations. Then they'll start the process of getting an arrest warrant for them because they know they got a gun. And so, therefore, they'll be arrested for that affidavit that they said they didn't have a gun. So, the getting connected to Philly PD and their detective divisions. Um, I know you talked to Healy about the MOU that is yet to be signed. Um, we are working out that process particularly so that we can make sure that we get every gun that we can off the streets. Do you have statistics on um, referrals for investigations when you when you do have suspicion that an individual or you know an individual have a gun um, that you were referring to the Philadelphia Police Department? I don't think we, we that's not in effect yet. Basically, Philly PD has been in charge of PFAs and that situation. It's only to... So this is part find, of your new collaboration? Huh? So this would be a part of your new collaboration moving forward? Yeah, this, this is a part of our new collaboration with the MOU, making the sheriff office yeah. the primary people for that. But that had not been a part of ours. PD has yeah. normally handled all of that. Up until we sign that, that becomes mm -hmm. a, what we will keep track of. Okay, I'm, I'm. Thank you for that clarity. I had the impression that this was something that was already um, in motion or in movement as well. Um, do we have do y'all document the number of court orders per year that require firearm um, relinquishments? You have that? Yeah. Yes. In 2020, we had 590 required firearm relinquishments. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, I hear you. Yeah. 590 required firearm relinquishments. Now, the 590 could be here in Philadelphia. It could be in another state. It could be outside of uh, Philadelphia, but here in the county of Pennsylvania. So what we'll do is investigate that. Of those 590, 78 actually here, we either have an affidavit stating that they do not have a um, firearm or we actually got the firearm. And that's just in 2020. So the 590... We investigated all 590. We went to the house. We tried to get in contact with the individual. And of those 590, 78, we, got, we was able to get a uh, affidavit signed or the actual weapon. And that's just in 2020. In 2021, there was 1,120 that required firearm relinquishment. And again, the same thing. We investigated all 1,100 or so. Again, just to be clear, out of state or out of county. Of that 1, 1,125, 164, 164, either we have an affidavit stating that they do not have it or we have the weapon. And so far here in 2022, 423, the same thing, required it. And those, those 423, 48, we were able to get the affidavit or the weapon. 
Um, I think we have a more in depth on that. You want to do Shama two? Shama two that works in our arm. We can give you that report for twenty and twenty one. Yeah. Good morning. So in twenty twenty, we had um, two hundred and twenty seven weapons surrendered. That was for a total of one hundred and forty two cases. Each case could require a few more weapons to be surrendered than one. Um, and in 2021, we had 363 weapons surrendered and uh, on 176 cases. Okay. Any number of individuals who signed affidavits and said that they didn't have any guns and y'all found out that they did have a gun? We don't have that. We don't have that. We don't have that stat because we didn't deal with that with the Philly PD at that time. But what, we, what we're finding out is, and this is what we're trying to update with the courts, is that on the PFAs, they will say weapon, but would not be clear. Because a weapon could be a broom, a bolt, a toaster. Uh, one of them was even a, a um, um, what you call, baking rolling pin. So when they say, and a knife. So when they say weapons, it's not necessarily a gun. So that's what we're working on with the court. They got to be clear when they say weapon. Okay. Could you keep us? Uh, uh, can you keep us updated on that process in any way we could be supportive? That yes. would be helpful. Okay. Um, and, here in, in the sheriff's office, we're now trying to establish our PFA unit because once this becomes our baby, which is once I sign the affidavit, all that information is going to be on us. And so we're trying to establish a PFA unit. And so that means okay. more um, support as far as officers that we need to require. So, you know, I'm coming. So the I'm members like, of council on the door. <laughs> the, the members of council who are here um, on this call that's participating in the special committee on gun violence hearing on domestic violence to be aware that the sheriff's office is creating a specific unit to deal with protection from abuse orders and they shall need support. And that's why they that's not why they're here today, but that's part of the key component of their presentation, which I commend. Um, and I'll say for the record that you will have my advocacy um, and my support because this issue is that critically important. So um, I thank you, Sheriff, for stepping up to the plate uh, with your team. And we, have sure that we have one more group that does this. Our warrant unit mm -hmm. that works 24-7. And Sergeant Morris can give you their stats on that. Those are warrants. Sure. I want you warrants that PFAs and have warrants that we went out on for the past two years. Sergeant. Good morning, uh, Sergeant Morris from the PFA Service Unit. I'm about to read a uh, PFA report uh, that's uh, consisted over the last two years since Sheriff Rochelle Bilal took over the Sheriff's Office. Uh, basically, since April of 2020, the Philadelphia Sheriff's Office has processed and served or attempted service on 9,496 protection from abuse orders. 1,127 of those had active warrants. We averaged 21 new protection from abuse orders a day. We are currently on pace to exceed our previous year total of 5,184 orders. For officer safety and preparation for possible weapon relinquishment, the defendant on every PFA is checked using the National Crime Information Center database, which is NCIC, where we check criminal history, both for convictions and prior charges and active warrants. In the last two years, April 2020 to March 2022, 1,127 defendants had active warrants, such as arrest warrants from local and out-of-state agencies, bench warrants, probation warrants, domestic relations warrants. If the extradition was approved by the issuing jurisdiction, the warrant was served, the arrest stats are included, and the 2,036 arrests made by the Sheriff's Office Warrant Unit over the last two years under Sheriff Rochelle Bilal. Any registered handguns the defendant may have purchased in Pennsylvania, that database is maintained by the Pennsylvania State Police. But we uh, monitor it because the results have to be examined for accuracy to ensure that the record of sale matches the defendant. No, shotguns and rifles won't show up during this search because they don't have to be registered in the state of Pennsylvania. That was the PFA report on the last two years with warrants that were attached to the PFA orders that the sheriff's office served on a daily basis. 
just note that we got involved when the Women Against Abuse asked us to help with the serving of the PFAs during the pandemic. And we gladly, um, I geared my staff, especially my warrant unit to, and my civil unit to go out and assist Philly PD in reference to serving these PFAs. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments from members of the committee? What, you asked one of them. Yeah, we got a whole lot of stats we keep oh, okay. doing. We get ready. Go ahead. Any uh, information provided? Yes. Charlotte, we'll send you this whole package so you have counsel. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, some of the stats just by weapons, the increase, like the sheriff explained earlier, as far as needing more space, you know, the numbers are going to just keep going up of weapons that we are getting. From 2018 to 2019, we saw 105 more weapons surrendered. Um, in 2019 to 2020, we saw 46 more surrendered, but that was the year of COVID, so we were, you know, initially in the beginning of the year getting less. But our big year from 2020 to 2021, we saw 136 more weapons surrendered. So each year it is gradually going up. We're already on pace this year to surpass that. When we talk about PFAs and uh, domestic violence, particularly with guns, do you categorize and separate and these stats, weapons, the guns versus everything else? Yeah, these stats I'm giving you are are mostly firearms. Most Some are firearms. knives, but what right. we take in, yes, is firearms. Uh, right. Very few of these are knives or edge weapons. Good, good to hear that. Good to hear that. Any additional information? Everybody good? Yeah. I think they gave you all the stats on. I'll make sure you get this package so you'll have it at your hand. Any other yeah. questions you may have. I'm also going to send you some pictures of our armory, um, mm -hmm. on how we updated everything in it. And so you're going to see such a small space that we are in in this building. Okay. Maybe we can do a tour. I can yeah. check it out. All right. Well, listen, I want to first and foremost thank you, Commissioner Rochelle Bilal, and your team for taking time out of your schedule and being here today and providing us this very informative information. And also, let's just stay in contact regarding the work that you're doing to get the courts on um, to begin clarifying, you know, the weapon, the the, wep the listing of weapons. So um, I believe that'll go a long way in terms of the work that we're doing. And then most importantly, just um, thank you and your team for your service to the city of Philadelphia. Thank you so much, Councilman. We appreciate being here. Anytime. Well, any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Hearing none, at this time we will take a brief uh, we will take a brief break while we will allow individuals to come on for a public comment. Hello? 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 Just state your name for the record and begin your public comment. Um, you're on mute, Yolanda. Shonda? Are you talking oh. Shonda? <laughs> no, I said Hello? Yolanda, Yolanda oh, J. Yeah. I can't hear you. So we're going to start with Shonda while Yolanda get hers together. Shonda, you want to begin? Hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Shonda Wright, and I'm actually um, a victim of um, domestic violence. Um, I personally, currently, right now, have at least four cases pending against the individual who I have a PFA against. You can't hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Apologies. Okay, so I currently have four pending cases against the individual that I have a PFA against, as well as a pending case against his Hello? Yes. Yeah, I think you're going to 
Say that again. I said you you can finish your testimony, but you're going in and out. Oh, apologies. I'm not sure why. Okay, so I currently have four pending cases against him, a case against his cousin, and a case against his niece. Um, all of all of them has have, have continuously harassed me, stalked me. Um, the niece even went as far as filing a false PFA against me. Um, I do think there's a, a flaw in the system with PSAs as far as cross-referencing and things of that nature because him and Denise actually share the same last name. So had there been some sort of reference or cross-reference or database, um, it would have been acknowledged that, yes, this, this person is coming to file a PSA against her. However, the person she has a PSA against, have, they share the same last name. Okay. Um, also, I feel like his constant violation of the PSA has not been addressed. He constantly is able to um, make bail or even, you know, be provided the opportunity to make bail when it, it, it shows a pattern. Um, I've even turned over the evidence where he has stated to not only myself, but basically the judge who, who, who did the PSA that he's going to continue to violate it, and it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything to him. Um, yet and still he's granted the opportunity to continuously make bail, which uh, continues to put my life at risk because he keeps violating it. Um, also, he's been circumventing the law in order to um, continue to harass me, stalk me, and, um, you know, just make my life difficult with the abuse. You know, as far as, like I said, he has recruited his, his cousin, his um, niece, to continue the harassment and abuse. Um, also, I feel like the system has been flawed, and I fell through the cracks when it came to the DA's office. Um, so originally when we went to court, um, after the original PSA was issued and he violated the PSA, I was, you know, I went to the, I showed up to court. Um, the young lady who was handling the case from the DA's office, we went out the courtroom and went into like a little small room on the side. Now, during the course of that, we went over what she said were going to be the stipulations. Um, I was told that he was going to get six months probation. I was told he was going to be um, mandated to attend um, alcohol and drug counseling, um, anger management, as well as he had to get a psych evaluation. Um, upon all of this, I was told to stay in the small room, and I wasn't able to go back into the court room when they, you know, did the final disposition. Um, or the temporary disposition, should I say, because the final one still hasn't been done. Um, however, when upon um, the follow up from court, I come to I came to learn that he was never he was never told he had to be on probation. Probation was never, um, I guess, put on the table. Um, as well as uh, he, he, like pretty much, I was misled. Everything I was told was supposed to be a stipulation for him wasn't completed, and I felt like because I wasn't allowed in the courtroom, I, you know, it, it, I fell through the cracks. I, I, I wasn't able to, you know, say anything or actually even hear what was said to him. Um, and then come to find out, the DA who who did my case quit two days later. And I was never reassigned a new a new DA. So when I called to follow up to say, you know, hey, what's going on with my case? Um, he's still violating the PSA and things of that nature. I was given the runaround because no one knew, basically no one knew the status of my case, I guess because the DA had resigned who was handling my case. Um, no one could really tell me what was done or said. Um, and I felt helpless, and I still continue to feel helpless because now here it is, you know, I have four pending cases against this, this man who continues to harass me, stalk me, and, and his own way abuse me, um, although it has not been physical because it hasn't been physical. I, but, however, it gives him the, op the ample opportunity to get to the point where it does get physical again. I have a, 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 a mark, a scar should I say, on the going down the whole left side of my face from this individual. He took a construction flashlight and beat me across my face with it um, repeatedly. So at the end of the day, it shows that he can be violent. His, he has a history of being violent. And granted, it may have been a gap in the time that he was violent, but if you go back to his history all, back, all the way back to the 80s, you can see all of his cases that he has has been for an aggravated assault, simple assault, all on females. So I just feel like the system has 
allowed me to fall through the cracks and um, continue to be abused um, by this person as well as his family. I went and I asked about, well, is it a way I can get it? You know, technically a PSA is supposed to include the person and anyone associated with him. Um, but apparently that wasn't the case when the niece was able to go file a PSA against me to get me um, kicked out my own home. Now, I have currently been kicked out of my home almost for two months now due to this. She broke into my home, uh, burglarized my home, changed my locks and everything. Um, and because of the, 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 the safety issue that's at hand, I haven't even been able to return home. I'm currently waiting for them to pick her up. There's a warrant for her arrest for her burglarizing my home, but um, she's still running the street, even though there's an active warrant against her. Um, and I feel for my life. I feel helpless. I feel, you know, unhappy, uh, dissatisfied. Um, and the system, although, you know, I understand all the, the, um, the strides that the system is, you know, that people are making to try to make the system better, there are still many flaws within it that allows individuals like myself to continue to be abused and harassed in various ways. Um, and it's a little disheartening, uh, and I, I, it, it's, it's, it needs a lot of work, even down to maybe taking the precautions. Uh, I know back in the day they had the GREAT program, they had the DARE program within the school. How about we create programs where it teaches uh, young females and young males what's appropriate relationships or what healthy relationships look like. The same way, you know, those programs were created to prevent drug abuse and those uh, programs were created to prevent gang violence. Um, I feel like domestic violence is it, it's on the rise, especially since COVID, you know, with the, the you know, the stay at home order that was in place. I know the, um, the numbers drastically increased and, being as though myself, I actually work for Philadelphia Police um, Dispatch 911, and I know on a regular basis, just me as a call taker, majority of the cases we receive are, are domestic. And I just feel like the system really needs um, to be reevaluated in, in, in different ways to help, to help individuals like myself who continue to be abused. Thank you, Shakin, and thank you for your courage in providing um, this feedback, and we will take it into consideration as we look at the other recommendations as well on how we're going to address this issue moving forward. Thank you. You're welcome. Will the clerk please call the next person for a public comment? Next, we have Stephanie Wright. Stephanie, you can begin your testimony. Hello. Yes, Stephanie. Yes. Yes, you can begin your testimony. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Wright. I'm the mother of Shonda Wright, who was abused. She left her abuser, and she's further being abused emotionally and by retaliation of his family. I, I feel helpless as a mother, and I'm doing everything I can to help her. There, the statutes and the system for domestic violence are broken. I ask you, how can a PFA be filed against someone when the PFA unit utilizes a swearing in and not verification? Example, the niece filed in retaliation. They have no data. Ms. Wright, Hello? can you turn on yes. TV background? Can we hit the TV Okay. Back? Okay, one second. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Wright. I'm the mother. Perfect. Go ahead, Ms. Wright. Um, uh, my daughter's um, been further retaliated on by a niece who was allowed to file a PFA. Um, I found out through my research there is no database with database within the PSA intake unit. So anyone can come in and make allegations. Um, the system needs to have some type of search for clarity. 
Had they had a system in place, they would have known the address and issue in which the niece filed my daughter had previously filed against her uncle, um, who has a history of abuse. He's been circumventing the system, stalking and harassing her. He has four cases. My research based on the laws of Pennsylvania for stalking and harassment state anything more than two, he should be charged with a third degree felony because it's excess excessive. No one has taken time to review the cases, not even the DA. Furthering his ability to harass, um, he's also circumvented the system, even to include L and I. He is currently taking over a property directly next door to my daughter through L and I's citation, so he and his family can keep abusing her. It's by God's grace I ran into Councilman Johnson. I want to thank him for allowing me to speak today and trying to help me. However, we are still running into a brick wall. This is why more often than not, our mothers, sisters, children, and cousins return to their abuser. The system must be fixed, and it has to start somewhere. Again, I thank you, Councilman and the panel, for allowing me to speak today. I ask that I be included in future discussions. As a concerned mother, I will not stop until changes are made. Thank you very much, Ms. Wright, and thank you for uh, your courage and, and your story. Um, obviously, you're going to support your daughter as you should, and just for bringing these issues to the forefront. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Would a clerk please call the next person for a public comment? I believe we have Yolanda Jennings. Um, Yolanda, I think you're on mute again. Hello. Hello. Yes, who's this? <laughs> If this is uh, Jonathan Hankins, uh, you may begin yeah. your testimony while we wait for uh, the technical um, to be fixed on Ms. Jennings. That's right, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, sir. Jonathan. Jonathan, are you there? Yolanda, are you there? You might have to log out and log back on, maybe. Brett, is the next person for public comment available? Those were the last two. Um, maybe we can give council support a moment to try to get um, Mr. Hankins back on. I did hear him. Mr. Chair, I was just told by council support that um, Mr. Higgins is being called back in in one moment. Okay.
Yolanda Jennings. I'm a certified domestic violence advocate. I currently sit on the board of the Purple House Project PA, Incorporated, founded by Christine Joy Brunson as the Director of Public Relations. I'm sorry, let me just do something because I have an echo. Let me see. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on. Oh, let me mute this. Is this better? Yes. Okay. All right, so my name is Yolanda Jennings, and I'm a certified domestic violence advocate. I currently sit on the board of Purple House Project PA, founded by Christine Joy Brunson as the director of public relations. At my day job, I help women who, among other stressors, may be in abusive relationships or impacted by domestic violence and gun violence. My passion for bringing awareness to domestic violence and gun violence is very personal. I'm a survivor of domestic violence. I'm a mother who has stood by helplessly as my daughters and son have been victims of intimate partner abuse. In 2004, my only biological sister was stabbed to death by her fiancé, leaving behind two small children. In 2019, my cousin was shot multiple times by the father of her three small children while her youngest laid asleep next to her. She died from her wounds a few days later. It's often frustrating as an advocate when a victim reaches out for help. As advocates, we're trained to direct victims to the domestic violence hotline. I know firsthand, being a survivor, what it takes to have the courage to make that first call for help or to try to get an order of protection. Oftentimes, the abuse has been going on for some time, and you finally get to that point where it's escalating and you know it's time to get out, only to be told you may have to stay in the situation until there's an opening in a shelter or you must wait for the abuser to cause visible bodily harm before a PFA is granted. With only 200 beds designated for victims in the city of Philadelphia, victims are often told that there is no room for them. If they have multiple children, it's even more difficult for them. They are told to keep calling back daily to see if there's any beds for them. Women Against Abuse reported they have they were forced to turn away an average of 6,160 requests for shelter every year for fiscal years 2017 to 2021 because their two 100-bed emergency safe havens, which provide the only shelter beds for survivors of domestic violence in Philadelphia, were already full. The question is often asked, why doesn't she just leave? The question should be, where is she going to go and be safe? I'm proud that the city of Philadelphia is a safe haven for many from around the world. Yet we must do better in providing more safe havens for our victimized citizens, especially the children. I read an editorial in the Philadelphia Inquirer in January that said, even as gun crimes linked to domestic violence increased by 240%, the city had failed to effectively enforce State Law Act 79 that compels the subjects of protection from abuse orders to surrender their firearms. If this is true, Philadelphia must do better at enforcing the law and getting these guns out of the hands of known abusers. When a person gets a PSA, that takes a huge amount of courage because they may risk enraging the abuser even more. Statistics say 75% of domestic-related murders happen after the survivor leaves or attempts to leave. We must work collectively and collaboratively to ensure that victims are aware of all the resources that may be available to them.
I want to thank Council Member at Large Kendra Brooks personally for joining forces with Purple House Project in October of last year. Domestic Violence Awareness Month to bring our fourth annual My Purple Pass Domestic Violence Walk to the city of Philadelphia for the first time. In previous years, it had been held in Delaware County, but we saw a much greater need here. We marched down Hunting Park Avenue from 20th and Tioga to Hunting Park. We offered resource tables, opportunities for local vendors, informative speakers that included a mental health professional, a father sharing his story of losing his daughter to DV, and a self-defense demonstration. In conclusion, thank you, Council Member Kenyatta Johnson and the City Council Special Committee on Gun Violence Prevention for convening these hearings and allow me to share. Thank you very much, Yolanda. We appreciate you for taking time out of your schedule and providing some informative um, public comment. And um, just want to thank you for your hard work and your dedication around this issue. Thank you. I want to quick please call the next person for public comment. Um, I believe our last person is uh, Mr. Jonathan Hankins, if council support was able to reconnect. Jonathan Hankins. Mr. Hankins, are you there? Give him a call. Okay. Council support is calling him now, Mr. Chair. Please leave your message for two six seven eight nine seven four eight three. Since we are not able to reach him, Mr. Chair, that is the last speaker for public comment. Okay. Is anyone else um, available for public comment? Hearing none. Um, this concludes a special hearing on gun violence and domestic violence by the Special Committee on Gun Violence. I want to thank all of my colleagues for taking time out of your schedule on this Friday uh, to participate in this very critically and important um, hearing. And I want to thank all the panelists for taking time out of your schedule and providing so much needed, valuable information and recommendations as we address this issue moving forward. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care and have a great weekend. God bless. Thank you, Councilman. Great job. Thank you. You're welcome, Mark.